curtains from present in the past. Every week will be an animated bash. Woo! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Maybe a short but mostly shows. We'll talk, we'll analyze, exploring as we go. What a cartoon! Hello, everybody, and welcome to What a Cartoon, where we could chew on sores all night. I'm your host, the noise checker outer, Bob Mackey, and this is an audio exploration of every cartoon ever who is here with me today. Henry Gilbert, and I'm somebody who chooses my side of the bed very carefully. It's very important. And today's episode is the Dr. Katz Professional Therapist episode, Bully. Put the cookie down! So this is another exploration into the Tom Snyder slash Lauren Bouchardiverse. So, so far we have done uh, this one. We're currently doing it right now. We're in progress. <laughs> We've also done Bob's Burgers and Home Movies. So yes. remaining, there are a surprising amount of shows in this world. So the obvious ones are Science Court mm -hmm. and Lucy, Daughter of the Devil. But if you look at the amount of things that Tom Snyder slash Soup to Nuts have done and Lauren Bouchard, there's things like uh, the Dick and Paula Celebrity Special, Hey Moni, O'Grady, and others. So yeah. there's a whole lot of these types of shows out there. I O'Grady actually got a real run that I was not aware of until doing research a while ago. I think that uh, the Dick and Paula show I accidentally stumbled upon on FX. It it felt like for a year-long period, Tom Snyder could get a bunch of meetings to sell a show. Like in 1999, when Dr. Katz ended, he had a bunch of meetings. But then once the show is produced and they finish their first run, the person who is programming is just like, we don't want this. Put it, air them all at night, and then never air them again. <laughs> bury them. Bury them in yeah. the airwaves. So before we start Henry, where did we first have our first encounter with Dr. Katz? I want to oh, know from you. Oh, man, oh, man. Well, I'm sure you might predate me on this one. Uh, perhaps. Uh, well, like a Smithers-style loser in 1995, <laughs> I was watching a lot of comedy Central. Oh, yeah, which I find quite unusual. <laughs> uh, and I definitely saw this when it first premiered. Like, maybe not the premiere episode, but seeing the ads for Dr. Katz made me want to watch it instantly, like, because it was, let's say, animated show on uh, Comedy Central. And so I was going to watch whatever was new on there. They also rarely had original programming that wasn't MST3K back then. Uh, and so I was going to watch it anyway. And then just it immediately clicked with me. And I, as, as it started as a show that I liked watching the comics for, I more so got into the actors on it, mm -hmm. uh, especially H. John Benjamin, and just so got into the show. And I think this episode was a big turning point for me when I realized how much I liked the people who weren't comedians on the show. And so I I watched it obsessively from that point onward. So a turning point in my life as a young man was in April of 1996, when my cable network finally got Comedy Central. Uh, so I had to wait a very long time. And I was ready to pounce on that network because I had no real access to Mystery Science Theater. This is before the VHS tapes were being released. And I had a real hunger for Mystery Science Theater because my only exposure to it was the Mystery Science Theater Hour and the syndicated oh, version yes, of the show yeah. in which the episodes were cut in half, given bumpers with Mike Nelson. <laughs> and uh, basically, that was the only exposure to MST3K I had. So I was ready for pure uncuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. black heroin MST3K <laughs> pumping through my veins. The nerdiest of shit. Yes. But I was also ready for all the stand-up comedy, all of the weird cable crap that I loved, and it was all waiting for me in April of 96. In fact, I watched the last episode of MST3K after coming home from a soccer game in 96, like the one year I played soccer, <laughs> and that was Laser Blast. Oh. And I had no idea that it was the last episode because I was not online yet. I was like, this is a weird ending for Mystery Science Theater. <laughs> oh, well. Here's too many new episodes. <laughs> uh, and then it moved to Sci-Fi Channel. Did you, uh, did you at least have Sci-Fi Channel? Oh, when yes. It yes, I was okay. totally ready for that. But yeah, Comedy Central 
since that year, so Comedy Central from April 1996 until probably when I graduated from high school in 2000, like every summer was just nonstop watching Comedy Central, like every losery day of my losery life without oh, a job. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I at least one or two summers I spent taping the Dr. Cats had daily airing uh, yeah. during the summer. And so I taped every episode I could then. I had my Dr. Cats tape next to my Space Ghost tapes and my Simpsons tapes and my MST3K tapes. Like it was another show I just obsessively watched over and over again. And I bought uh, for Dr. Cats the fancy Sony eight hour version. Ooh, nothing yeah. but the best for Dr. Cats. <laughs> but yeah, I think it was that summer that I first really got into Dr. Katz and it struck me because it's one of the reasons the show caught on and that it sounded like no other show and that it looked like no other show. Mm -hmm. And that was also important for things like the Simpsons. Like you want to, with all the cable networks that are popping up, you want to stop people in their tracks saying, what the hell is this? (laughs) And that is exactly what you would say when you stumbled upon Dr. Katz, but it was captivating. And I was a major fan of the show until it ended. And I really loved revisiting it for this podcast. Yeah, me too. It was so uh, great to reawaken my love of it. It's not like I, never watched it in the last decade but it was something i didn't revisit a ton and when i did though it would take me right back to my teen years of watching the show over and over again and i think also because i was a dumb 13 year old i think it wasn't until the second season of the show that i realized like oh this is stand-up they are presenting stand-up in the show it took me a long time to realize he wasn't actually a doctor yeah i just assumed he was uh but yeah i watched it a million times when i like went through a list of the guests on the show and was just remembering all the stand-ups i loved on it this was definitely a show that informed my comedy sensibilities i think even more the cooler thing to say is that mr show really shaped it after the simpsons and this is that's true Mm. but dr katz before that really in influenced it for me i could see that yeah and so we are famously on this network an anti-dad network yep but I will say this is one of the few good shows about a dad mm-hmm. that the focus is about being a dad, but it's not about the glory mm-hmm. of being a dad. You don't know how hard it is, Henry, to be a dad. <laughs> uh, I think like because we are both like Ben Katz and that oh, we yeah. are I mean, we're very doing very well now, but we live the life of being an aimless loser in our 20s, obsessed with pop culture and just also obsessed with laying around and being a slob. Yeah. And uh, uh, the ideal life for me was being Ben Katz, but also having a loving, educated father <laughs> who was very gentle and playful uh, like Dr. Katz. Like, I feel like Dr. Katz, I wish he was my real fake dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, incredibly flexible and loving and uh, supports whatever you want. Like, just saying, so many episodes are been saying, uh, you know, I think I could do this. Well, I really support that. Yeah. And, uh, I think you should give that a He's try. He's just happy when Ben leaves the yeah. apartment. No, the, um, looking back on this too, I think Ben's loserdom really did lay a pattern for me of the life I uh, did lead mm-hmm. up until I was 26, I think, of just like, yeah, I want to eat cereal, lots of cereal, just watch TV, have, have uh, know every show that's on TV, and just also be like, well, yeah, I watched TV, and then I took a nap, and then I watched some more TV. That was, I was that was a dream. I was not quite as uh, I was not quite as jobless as Ben though. Mm-hmm. That was part of the fantasy for me. Like, oh, <laughs> if only I could not have a job. All the TV I could watch, all the internet I could use. Well, and I did live at home until twenty five mm. as well. Like, I think I was the same way. I think that twenty five. Uh, knowing that Ben was 25 on the show, I think did uh, light you, a fire under me of like, oh shit, I'm Ben's age now. I don't like this. It gave you a ticking clock. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the the Ben was easily my favorite character watching it. I mean, now I, I'm getting closer to the age of uh, D- Jonathan Katz in yeah. the show. I would love to grow up to be the man that Jonathan Katz is. He's just a funny guy who helps people. Like and he's that. still <laughs> kicking around there. Yeah, yeah. Despite his health problems, he's doing great. So I want to talk about the state of cable TV. It's very interesting in that cable TV is changing at this point in time because this is a 1995 show. But Dr. Katz fits squarely into the old model of cable TV in which the networks were like, we have very little money. Well, actually, we have a lot of money. We don't want to pay for anything. Oh, yeah. So we can't make entirely original shows, but... How about we pay you to make a framing device for existing content, which mm-hmm. is where things like Space Ghost come from and Mystery, and Mystery Science Theater and things on MTV where they showcase weird animation and they showcase uh, music videos that are brought to them by companies. <laughs> so like Dr. Katz is, let's write original material, but also let's get stand-ups to come in and do their bits. So it's mm-hmm. very much fitting into that old cable framework of the show is a framing device. Yeah, yeah, I think... 
You know, I have such a love for cheap cable productions. Me back then. too. Yeah. But a problem with looking back on a lot of them now is like they were invented out of a necessity to avoid organized labor. Like that too. That too. Yeah. Like they interns wrote Space Ghost, and it makes Space Ghost one of the weirdest, best things ever. But that was also because paying a professional writer who is part of a guild will cost more money than Cartoon Network wants to spend. And same with I love, love, love Mystery Science Theater, but operating outside of Los Angeles also made it a cheaper production for Comedy Central. Yeah, everything I love seemingly in early cable days was that package thing, the uh, the framing device around a package of content, things like Talk Soup, of course, that too. Just oh, like, yeah. let's hire somebody and write like six minutes of material and then just play. <laughs> Plugging clips. All the E! News shows I watched that were like, well, it's the trailer show. You can't watch a bunch of trailers on the internet yet. So uh, I'm somebody who hosts trailers and you watch them like that. That was content. And yes. I, I watched it a ton. Like in Comedy Central, the majority of its programming back then that wasn't just reruns of things was getting uh, comedians who were paid, I think, more in exposure than money to do free entertainment for them or that cheap is, entertainment. That is really a thing that happened because so uh, one of our friends, Pop Arena, he was on the What a Cartoon episode of Duck. He does an amazing YouTube show called Knickknacks. Yeah. And what that it. does, it's super, super in depth. I mean, I wish every YouTuber could be this committed to research, but he has gone through every episode of Nickelodeon in order most of which you would never remember mm -hmm. and some of which there is no existing footage of. I love when he, he has to deal with that like he's he, he's always up to the task he's a real detective so I wish someone would do this with Comedy Central because uh, as part of this podcast research, I was going back through old promos, and I did not recognize 80% of the programming mm. in all of these old promos. In fact, when in the late 90s, when I was online and getting tapes of old Comedy Central episodes of Mystery Science Theater, it was so much fun to see all the promos for Comedy Central shows I had never oh, seen yeah. in my yeah. life. Like, all of these one-season nothings where it's just they give a stand-up a set, and they send them places. I don't know. Just so many weird ideas, so many weird shows. Mark Marin hosting a short attention span theater, which is part of the legacy of dr katz we'll talk about that later like just all of these weird comedians and weird spots you would never expect them given shows <laughs> on a nothing cable network short attention Man's theater is the only one of those shows that i can even name anymore that isn't you know a, a lorne michaels show rerun like snl or kids in the hall or mystery science theater the only other one i can name is short attention span theater because other than that it was uh to me the comedy central programming i remember pre-1995 was just an endless stream of stand-up shuffled around in another way the like the only difference would be where they were doing the stand-up like what type of stage they <laughs> did it and now i know that they were probably all recorded like in one week of like we rented this theater for one week we're doing eight hours of stand-up a day just shuffle in and out and that's two years of programming for us and who shot mr burns part one is a great snapshot of what comedy central was in 1995 it was a nothing network a network with not a lot of original stuff the only original good stuff people like was mystery science theater and dr katz was entering that world at that time by the time the late 90s rolled around, things like Jon Stewart's The Daily Show and South Park would transform the network mm -hmm. into a juggernaut, and Comedy Central would quickly change its image, and that's why Dr. Katz went away yeah. in 99. Yeah, they, they went from being the premier original programming to the least wanted original programming, and that's... That's entertainment, folks. It yes. can just happen overnight. One day, you're just a guy working at a box factory. <laughs> Luckily, uh, Katz did not have to go to the box factory. <laughs> so let me talk about the run of Dr. Katz really quickly. So Dr. Katz aired from May 28th, 1995 to February 13th, 2002. That is a, a great misnomer. I'll clarify that in a mm -hmm. second. So 81 episodes. So it really ended in 1999. In fact, they burned off most of the episodes on Christmas Eve of that year. That pissed me off when yeah. I saw that. Like, wait, all these. That's when I knew it was canceled when I was just tuning in over the holiday break and it's like, well, it's a bunch of new Dr. Katz episodes. Like, what? wait, what? What? Why? I think they burned off half the season, but at least they showed all of it. Oh, wait, no, they didn't. For some reason, they had three episodes they just held on to until 2002. 
why? Yeah, and there's why? no there's no proper finale. I watched the last episode. It is, uh, I mean, it has a lot of celebrities in it. So Conan O'Brien and Whoopi Goldberg are in it. Oh, but that's the last one. Wow, there's no yeah. proper like this is it. Just, you know, shrug for us. I didn't know if they knew they'd be ending, but it kind of. I mean, no, it really sucks that Comedy Central just like, oh yeah, we won't show these three until like three years after it's really over. Mm-hmm. But when you all have forgotten what Doctor Katz is post nine eleven, Doctor Katz cannot exist post nine eleven. It is the no. coziest ninety show <laughs> really in the world. Uh, yeah, I know the the character of Ben and all of the comedians' problems are all the things you think when you're like end of history thoughts like that whole the Clinton era just was a well everything's normal yeah now. my VCR thing. clock won't stop blinking <laughs> no way it, it comes a lot of their stuff comes in the same vein of belief that the film American Beauty does of just like oh everything's fine now I'm I. I am uh, tired. Like, that's all it was. Which, uh, boy, I'd, I'd love to go back to that. That'd yes. be pretty nice. I miss being annoyed by the foibles of modern life. But mm-hmm. I will say, so in case you don't know where Dr. Katz is, there are DVD sets, of course. It's all, it's all on YouTube. No one's policing that. Essentially, it is a showcase of stand-ups under the guise of a stand-up talking to a therapist. So mm-hmm. while watching it upon this viewing... As a, an older man, I had the galaxy brain thought that's very obvious. It's like, wait a minute, stand up comedy is therapy. <laughs> These guys are just getting out their demons and their baggage in front of all of us. So I feel like I didn't know if that was intentional mm-hmm. or what, but I was like, oh, this is the perfect. The perfect framing device for stand up is therapy. A lot of Dr. Katz's, as a show, you know, creative choices, some of them feel planned, and then others, it just feels like accidental like just this is the way the river ran you know this is the way nature said it and i feel like that that's something that came out as they did it they realized like oh we're actually giving therapy to people as we do that this is weird huh or like and people like mark mayer would lean into that like yes this is me giving myself therapy in front of you oh no the best some of the best bits on the show were the people who would leave their stand-up style entirely and would just be like what am I going to get better, Dr. Katz? What, <laughs> what are we going to do, huh? There's a really funny bit, actually. This is kind of a tangent, but uh, I watched the Mark Marin one, and his final bit is him complaining about the internet and how he hates it. And he, <laughs> the first time he logged on, he got a message, do you like dogs? That's and that was the final joke of the show. But now he is Mr. Internet, which is hilarious. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I didn't watch that one. I forgot that bit. God. It's fun to see uh, young, long-haired Mark Marin. Yeah, he's like, I can't. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about the origins of Dr. Katz. Mm. So number one guy behind all of this is Tom Snyder. And in every article you read, it has to point out, no, not the dead talk show host. It's a different <laughs> Tom Snyder. So Tom Snyder, we talked about him a bit on the Home Movies episode, but he was a designer of educational software in the 80s. And before that, he was a teacher. And he decided to enter the burgeoning cable market with his own creation. That logo at the end of every Dr. Katz is such an edutainment logo. It really is. Like, I would see that at Waldensoft in 1992. For some like learning how to count game or something. So then, as you're here seeing it, as you hear Penn Jillette talk about things, you're like, "Well, oh, this is so weird." The voice of Penn Jillette was like my soundtrack for the summers of '90s. It annoyed me on up the, next on Comedy Central <laughs> on the YouTube uploads of the show. I'm like, "Where's the Penn Jillette voice?" Yeah. She didn't tape this off the TV with Penn Jillette. Although Mystery Science Theater fans hated him, especially when they when he would talk over bits they would do over the credits. Oh yeah. yeah. So he was a hated figure for Mystery Science Theater fans. Uh, I understand it. I understand it. So I cannot find this online but while at a software company tom created a short called shrink wrapped where he played a psychiatrist and it was in uh, squiggle vision which we'll talk about later so he had a friend in the industry who introduced him to folks in the business who liked the idea of this barely animated show about psychiatry but Mm -hmm. they were basically like you need a name like no one knows who tom snyder the educational software guy is you need (laughs) a comedian or an actor or somebody attached to this project Mm -hmm. you're not going to get interest in you alone yeah i mean his he might open doors in the education educational fields or maybe even at game development places but if you want a general meeting with comedy central you kind of need a comedian as well for Mm -hmm. that like and that is the styling they did for home movies and all these other shows of like you uh, you have a creative and the comedian who is the center of it so he landed on jonathan katz of course the star of the show and luckily for tom snyder 
John Katz was a fellow mass hole. Yeah, <laughs> and, this uh, is such a fucking Massachusetts show. I had no clue. It's so crazy no. how it, most of it is done out of Massachusetts. So mm-hmm. he, so Jonathan Katz was Tom Snyder's favorite stand-up, but they also had an existing relationship. So John uh, was friends with David Mamet, the famous playwright, now yes. crazy person. So he had a small role in the 1988 movie uh, Things Change, and he also co-wrote one of David Mamet's movies. It wasn't a few more. Mm-hmm. So uh, Tom saw him in this movie and realized through some happenstance that like, oh, I'm kind of neighbors with John Katz we should hang out so that's how they established a friendship so when he when he was told like you need someone attached to this he's like John Katz perfect like Mm -hmm. I'll get John Katz on this Jonathan Katz was not like an overexposed comedian at that point you know you'd you'd see him in a movie here and there but yeah he he might come to your local like chuckle hut but he's he wasn't a famous guy like i uh he hadn't appeared on like snl or uh david letterman or any of these things that really stuck with you he was he was the perfect choice for the show but he was not a gets like this show made john katz a name period like oh yeah yeah. his name is in the show (laughs) so (laughs) he'll always be dr katz to everybody who sees him from now on and also because he looks exactly like his character. It's perfect, so, yeah. So even when you see him in person in the last few years, he still looks like his character, which I have a story about that, but that when you later. When you go bald early, you kind of lock in your look <laughs> for life. <laughs> yep. so, so another figure behind this, he has risen to fame as one of the greatest animation creators of the modern era, Lauren Bouchard. Mm-hmm. So he got a real lucky break. We talked a bit about that with home movies, but he was hired by Tom at the age of 23 to work on Dr. Cats, which was his first big break. Uh, so Tom was Lauren's teacher before he left teaching to make software. And by chance, they bumped into each other in Harvard Square when Tom was developing Dr. Cats. He's like, do you want a job? You used to draw things that I liked. Please work on Dr. Cats. And that's, that's how so he got the crazy. job. Yeah, That's so crazy that now he's like one of the most uh, prolific producers in animation today. And it's all because Tom Snyder told him to quit his bartending job and come back to drawing computer graphics for his TV show. It's just crazy. That's the, like, it is a real touchstone for a lot of television, you know, that it all because Tom Snyder and other Harvard uh, livers, not like townies in Harvard, not Harvard students, (laughs) wanted to do this. The real Cambridge folks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so basically, I didn't know this before doing this research, but the first Dr. Katz episodes were seven, I believe, one-minute pieces for short attention span theater and a few of those are on YouTube it looks a tiny bit different but the style is in place it's not as squiggly I will say that yeah I watched yeah I watched uh, I only watched one of those with Larry Miller yes with Larry Miller the uh, for some reason I want to call him like Jerry Seinfeld's friend but it's because Jerry Seinfeld plays his servant in the start in the opening sketch to one of his 80s SNL uh, HBO specials you're right about that Uh, but yeah no, the, the Larry Miller one like oh Larry Oh, Larry, that's uh, he's he's classic uh, Larry Miller stuff, and it pretty much is the format of the show. So that's a funny way to like pilot it on uh, short attention span theater, which. I don't listen to Marin as much as I used to, but I always love when that show comes up, Short Attention Span, because it makes him look so dismissively at any other Comedy Central show. <laughs> yeah. He still can't stop thinking about every other Comedy Central show from then as his competition, not a show he liked or watched. That's hilarious, because uh, I guess it's only known because of him, right? Totally. Basically. So, well, it was, just, it was just a clip package of stand-ups. Like, other shows were... This is a hosted night of comedy in the same place, and we're going to show a stand-up's full set. Short Attention Span Theater was like, let's get 30 seconds to two minutes of a clip of a stand-up spit and sketch stitch it together through some sort of theme that's communicated by Mark Marin in a closet, basically. I'm sure you can find some of those online. They've got to be. Oh, no, sure. It's, it's sure. fun to see young Mark Marin before he was uh, more grizzled. But mm-hmm. so as this is really glossed over in the oral history. I recommend uh, you go online and check out the Up Rocks oral history. I'm not sure how old it is, but all the formatting is broken. I think no article is destined to live more than two years on the internet. I mean, I have articles I wrote four years ago that like are just completely broken that I, well, I wouldn't want to send anybody to my old websites anyway, because fuck those websites. But secondly, I wouldn't send people to them because it looks like I forgot to put apostrophes in there and it's full of of typos because of that. 
I, I really hate going back to old <laughs> yep, stuff. Really uh, sucks. But yes, yeah, so uh, check out the Uproxx oral history. It is like 30,000 words. It's crazy. But this is basically the cliff notes of that. And it's there's a lot more going on in that oral history. But this is kind of glossed over in that oral history. It's not clear when it was picked up or why it was picked up or the struggle to get it picked up. But I believe they made the short attention span theater shorts. And then Comedy Central is like, let's make this a show. So, of course, in animation, you are working on more than one thing at once because animation, even this limited animation, takes time to do. Mm-hmm. So they deliver their first episode to Comedy Central. And the response is, oh, we love it. We can't wait to see what it looks like when it's finished. <laughs> and Tom is like, what are you talking about? It is finished. And, they're, and then they were like, oh, this could be so much better. So there was a major freak out. Tom is like, I'm going to have to cancel the ones in production if we're going to restart with a new style. We need more money, et cetera, et cetera. So after a short period of time, Comedy Central was like, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. It is just yeah. fine. I think it's like, oh. Real animation costs money. I believe whatever executive got this saw it, it was like, oh, this is the animatic for an animated show you will later produce. <laughs> Not knowing, like, this is the amount of money we spent on this. This is what this will pay for. Yeah, that's what it costs. Like, animation is, you know, you, The Simpsons, you find out later, you save some money on the, in the early seasons by not being a guild show or whatever. But the front loaded price of, producing animation even cheaply through Korea or other uh, secondary markets, you it still costs a ton of money. Like, I don't think... It wasn't until the digital age, and it was much more expensive, before Comedy Central had what one would call a fully animated show. Like, S- South Park isn't that. Like Yeah, like, uh, maybe... Dr- yeah, sorry, go ahead. Together, yeah. that was the one I was going to say. Uh, famously expensive it. for them, yeah. too. Which is, like, dog shit. You wouldn't think it cost that much. Like, that show... I hate that show. It's real awful, bad. yeah. Uh, we won't do it on this network. And if somebody... Uh, if, if you pay us... If you pay us, yeah. you can make us. But I like when I get challenges on Twitter, and my response is always, if you pay me, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, hey, it's a profession, baby. That's yeah, what it is. we'll do whatever you tell us, as long as as long as you give us money. So I can understand really why, if you're an executive in 1994, getting this saying, "What is this? It's not done." Because again, Doctor Cats looked like nothing on the air. It sounded like nothing on the air, and that's still true. Like mm-hmm. it still is very unique in its form of expression, and I can see why it would look like an unfinished product if you have never seen anything like it. Mm-hmm. The charm of Squiggle Vision is is there and it draws you in, but it, it, if if you were somebody who likes it, but I also think it probably did drive away a lot of people because of how it looks. Yeah, no, I I still it makes me feel fuzzy when I when I watch it, but then other times I'm like, man, eh, I'm just gonna look at my phone and listen. <laughs> it, it works just the same. It's a it's a, it's a good show and, a, and even a better podcast these days. <laughs> although I do like the drawings, we'll talk more about those later. So production. So the first season was a very do it yourself production. Almost like a, it was almost like a podcast, actually. So mm. the first season was recorded in Tom Snyder's pantry in his Cambridge house, wow. which the uh, the staff basically soundproofed themselves. So it's basically wow. people sitting in a small pantry, kind of like the size of the Retronauts recording studio, I'm guessing, which is inside of an old safe. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I like that DIYness of it. It really is. It did. It, it's how we pretty much do things now that's yeah. really impressive and when you hear the clips on this show they sound like they're uh, podcasts the mics are a little too hot you can feel the, <laughs> the sound of the room the tone of the room especially it's, with a screamer like Kevin Meany yeah. perhaps yeah <laughs> they really blow up the mics but yeah so the first season was very do it yourself and the major secret of Dr. Katz in that Tom Snyder says I don't want to ruin Dr. Katz for you but Katz did not record with the comedians mm. they tried that at first but Dr. Katz or sorry Sorry, Jonathan Katz has a very low key, very dry but whimsical sort of delivery. Mm. And they found that the comedians would often try to match that naturally. And often a lot of comedians would think like, oh, this is therapy. I'm not going to do my bits. I'm going to talk about my life. So Katz would be brought in after the fact to respond to things already recorded. Although he was in the room with other people like uh, H. John Benjamin and Laura Silverman, Will LeBeau and other people. With the comedians, he was not present. Man, that's... That is disappointing to hear. That is kind of like a Santa Claus is in real moment because I, in this very episode, I love what sounds like good chemistry between Katz and Behar or Katz and Romano, but uh, it sounds like 
Cats just recorded things that like Tom Snyder or somebody else said to them uh, when they were recording together, and yeah. then just he re-recorded over it. I'm sure that the reactions that Cats had were natural. I don't know how much mm-hmm. of it was scripted, but I'm sure if they had a bit like the Joy thing, that could have been like, okay, this is when Cats will respond or whatever. But <laughs> what actually happened was, so in the beginning, Lauren Bouchard and Tom Snyder were in a booth of sorts outside the pantry, and the comedians on their headsets, so the comedians could hear Tom and Lauren on their monitor laughing. Uh, so in a way in the beginning they were playing to an audience and then later with the second season they built a recording studio and in the booth there would be like a table so the comedian would think oh I'm in a club I'm I'm performing in a club to people who can uh, laugh but the laughs aren't picking up on mic. So in a way it was a way to capture a more natural performance from the comedian and Tom Snyder admitted in a kind of a weird way that uh, he deep down believed that all male comedians were just trying to get laid mm-hmm. so he'd often bring in pretty women that he knew and worked with to to sit in on the recording sessions to laugh at all the jokes. I think he's 100% right. Yes. I think that was a very smart move by Tom Snyder. I guess, yeah, boy, learning how to build the proper place to trick a comedian into giving their best performance probably teaches you a whole lot about the art of stand-up comedy. Yeah, it really changes the tone uh, when you change the context of performing stand-up. Mm-hmm. Like, Doc, uh, John Katz is hilarious, and he's hilarious with Ben, but that's a much different performance than someone telling their stand-up up to John Katz. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And also, like, what if they want to do it over? What if they want, and or if they're going over a tired old bit that they've done a million times, how do they find a way to make it feel conversational and new, you know? There was a period in the show's history before they built the studio, I think it was early season two, or maybe just season two in general, in which they would, uh, this is so do yourself, they would book hotel rooms in New York City and have comedians come in. And they said at one point, Kevin Meany thought he was sort of being punked in a way because he <laughs> screams so loud and they were putting blankets on top of him with the mic inside of it, like building a little <laughs> tent for him to scream inside. He's just like, what is this show we're making? Is this a real show? I love that. Oh my God, that's so funny. Uh, R.I.P. Kevin Meany. Yes, he is so great, especially on uh, Rocco, his few performances on Rocco. Yes. Oh, God. Yeah. Disapproving of the interracial relationship (laughs) on the show, interspecies relationship. Yeah, and then she secretly was in love with a turtle herself. Yes. Boy, that show broke new ground. It still is. (laughs) So let's talk about some of the trademarks of the show, some that are literally trademarks. So retro scripting, that is trademarked. Uh, No show was written like this on TV. It now sounds more like the improv podcast we're used to, but there was no context for anyone listening to this in 1995. This would continue into the future with other Soup to Nuts and Lauren Bouchard productions, but Cats by far is the loosest oh, yes. of the retro scripting shows. It makes it so charming. There is so much dead air. I love when the improv is obvious, when they're goofing around and Ben's like, hey, Dad, what about this thing? It's yes. like, okay, here we got to get to this point by minute two. <laughs> it's so cute and charming. But yeah, it is the loosest of the show. I think like in Bob's, so we're at Bob's Burgers now and I think like there'll be like two seconds in every episode where it's like, oh, they're talking to each other like real people. But then yeah. it's like back to heavily scripted stuff, which is fine because all TV is heavily scripted. But I, I miss the looseness and the coziness of this so much. The bouchard verse is about slowly shedding improv as they go. Like on, on home movies, they did write full scripts, but it sounded like it was more of a playground to mess around in. And that's also why some of my favorite bits in home movies were like ones on this show too, where specifically H. John Benjamin would say, why would I do this thing? Or this yeah. is stupid. Like I'd never do this. And just shitting on the very concept of the script as they're performing it. And what I really like about it is just the mess ups and the screw ups and the natural way of talking like that we often will cut out of podcasts ourselves. So mm-hmm. John Katz is a, like a, a deliciously delightful stammer. So like he'll start a sentence like, Ben, what do you, Ben, I, uh, Ben, why did you, Ben? And then he'll like do the sentence. So there's like a lot of like stammering. It's like if I was, if that was a podcast editor, I would just chop that out completely. Mm-hmm. But it adds to the natural and like the naturalness of the, the setting and everything. It makes you feel like you're in a room with these people. Yeah. And that is the biggest appeal of it, I think, too, like just on a time crunch way they if you had asked them to write a full script that they're not script writers and it wouldn't have been playing to their strengths anyway so it uh, it probably made things take a lot longer but just having funny people goof around together and then editing it together the best you can probably was the right move comparatively to writing a script that you then hand John Benjamin I mean especially well actually Katz and Ben in their own ways are people who I don't think love scripts or they are they're they're they, are, they, are, they, are re- yeah. they rebel against them and it's also very fun to hear Ben play a much gentler softer younger character mm. when everything he's played after that has been like gruff 
and like haggard and grizzled. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, 20, 20 year old Benjamin uh, just sowing his oats. He hasn't he hasn't been as burned by life yet as he comes off as in every other part he plays. The other trademark thing of the show is Squiggle Vision, which is patented. Mm-hmm. One of our listeners, I was talking about cats on Twitter, and uh, one of our listeners sent us the patent number. So That's, I looked it up, and it's online. You can wow. read about it online. So Squiggle Vision, don't you dare rip it off. <laughs> but as Brendan Small jokes about it, we copyrighted this thing no one wants. Yes. Like, that's it. He, he's not very nice to Squiggle no, Vision in the commentary. Um, so Tom Snyder viewed it as a means to an end. I have a good quote from him from that oral history. He says, um, you know, for every 10 people that we talk to that don't like it, we can find one that doesn't mind it that much. <laughs> that is my current description of the aesthetic power of Squiggle Vision. So yep. there you have it. But basically, it was a means to an end for Tom Snyder. He needed a way for illustrators to animate a show quickly, so he contacted Annette Kate, who would later be the head animator of Dr. Katz. Mm. So she was a children's book artist who worked for Tom's company, and Tom asked her to make his original short starring him, Wiggle. That's, that's, that's it. That's great that uh, I think, you know, until I was looking closely at these credits, I didn't, I didn't realize how many women were involved like creatively, like also... As far as like an artistic lead on a show, on an animated series, it being a woman, it kind of never happened. Yeah, especially in the 90s. And Tom was basically like, it worked well when I was in the short, but it works even better with Dr. Katz because Jonathan Katz is so cute. He is! Especially in that style. He is such an adorable character. And I will say, even if you don't like the squiggling of the show, Mm -hmm. I do love the character designs. Like They're very 90s, of course, but I like there are some good aesthetic choices in that all the backgrounds are like a black and white like wash and all the people that are separate from the backgrounds are just bright colors in your face yeah i i really like that i mean it probably also makes things easier using everything in grayscale but it makes everything pop out like it does i think the squiggling as a mental trick makes you think things are moving more than they are yeah. like once you see the home movies uh in season two when it's just hard lines and flat movement characters have to characters move a lot more but it actually feels like they're moving a lot less and yeah. it's, it's just much more static i looking i really find this look charming i understand why it wasn't pursued but it was an interesting shortcut before the true era of digital animation took over yeah i uh sorry i can't recall where i read it maybe it was in the in that oral history but i remember tom snyder joked about how they discovered animation accidentally working on squiggle Fish. i think it was the commentaries the commentaries yeah. for the show are great and very very candid Total, super candid oh my god he reveals some people did drugs in front of him at his at his there which i want to assume mitch hedberg like mitch hedberg but who wasn't doing drugs as a media in the 90s all were, yeah. yeah but uh but yeah about the he on the commentary they joke that like we invented animation <laughs> because uh before they just had characters statically not have their mouth uh move if they were talking their mouth was open and then one of the animators had a drawing of the the same drawing with a mouth open and a mouth closed and then they're like wait if you switch between those two <laughs> it looks like the mouth is moving so oh my god 90 years after it was invented they reinvented it <laughs> yes but uh, god bless those men and women but- i mean i can't imagine how cheap squiggle vision would be if their mouths didn't move oh like, god it'd feel 10 times worse I yeah think. and i guess the uh, so the patent is that uh the drawings that are made by the animators are procedurally changed mm. by an algorithm or something it's not like someone is drawing the same one over and over and they just cycle bethru- between them mm-hmm. it's like a, it's like an actual like programming thing i do think in 1995 something you know if you look at squiggle vision with t- with your current day eyes it just looks like cheaper than a thing you'd ever draw in ms paint but i do think it's an important context that like in 1995 to see anything animated by a computer yes was a novelty at the very least as a computer obsessed kid who really wanted a computer i'm like oh they made this with computers <laughs> and given where tom Snyder came from educational software it kind of looks like a video game like a computer video game oh, totally. of the era yeah so one funny thing about squiggle vision there is a anecdote in the oral history in that uh, the company General Cinemas, they wanted to show clips of Dr. Katz before movies because Mm -hmm. there's funny stand-up clips you can show and that would be a fun thing to show moviegoers. So they're going to make a deal. So there was a screening somewhere in Massachusetts. All of the uh, Tom Snyder Productions people were there. Comedy Central people were flown out from LA to see this screening of Katz shorts on a big screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lauren Bouchard said he didn't have any strong opinions about Squiggle Vision before this, but seeing it on a big screen literally made him sick. (laughs) And I think, honestly, I think it is like a 
mathematical thing and that squiggling is built for 60 frames per second mm. and having it tuned down to 24 produces an effect that makes you want to vomit. Yeah. I think it's like a mathematical brain thing. <laughs> uh, and then like on a four story screen as well, probably doesn't do it any favors either at its level of um, fidelity too. Like that's really hurt your feelings as a, as a film, as a maker of your show. You think, Oh, what an opportunity for us. Oh no, no. This, this has to be work. viewed through a, a pinhole in a shoebox. <laughs> that but, is kind of uh, limiting in your craft when yeah. you realize that. You can see why they broke away from it in the uh, season two of home movies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So again, it had a pretty ignoble end. The show, uh, they're not particularly bitter about it in the oral history they're like we were just sad we couldn't do it anymore but it sounds like they kind of got screwed in that getting your episodes burned off sounds like it really sucks i mean it's not like mission hill in which uh they only aired two Mm -hmm. and you had to basically wait to see the rest but still it seems like they got a pretty raw deal but comedy central was changing to be the much edgier in your face offensive network yeah i mean i heard bouchard on uh, one of the home movies commentaries joke about how like they thought their show was successful and then when the first ratings came in for South Park, they're like, oh, that's what a successful show is. Like, we aren't yeah. bad. And, like, and South Park was getting one one whole million. Yeah. I At least with, like, home movies getting burned by UPN, you can at least be like, well, this is it's prime time. They're at a premium of time. All Comedy Central has is time. They have all this time, like, just that they need to fill, that they would so wastefully be like, we need to fill time, but I don't fucking care. Nobody's going to see these things. Like, that's terrible. I felt the same way about Mystery Science Theater in that both with Comedy Central and Sci-Fi, like, this show is so cheap. Mm -hmm. You could just make it forever. What are you doing? People love it. Well, and then as an adult, you depressingly find out that it's not just about, like, what's cheap to make. It's also about what an executive likes and doesn't like, and you're just held to the um the tastes of a person who isn't funny in a lot of cases i can't believe we're more than 20 years removed from the end of mst3k yeah it's yeah. crazy which should never have ended no it's no. just in a way it hasn't though oh know? it never will yeah, that's it's good. so easy to do like and also it's democratized i mean people can make People can make Dr. Katz now. They can make MST3K. They don't need an executive's permission to make that shit, which is Mm -hmm. so good. So let's talk about the cast of the show. Uh, Of course, the lead is Jonathan Katz. So he's a super respected comedian who also dabbled in music. In fact, that was his first career. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he is known mostly for his very deadpan but whimsical delivery. He's not like a Stephen Wright and that he's deadpan and like sounds like he wants to die. He's deadpan but very playful and whimsical, which I like. It's very unique. It reminds me of actually of like Joel Hodgson. Yeah, 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 yeah. Though not as uh, a, a Jewish Joel Hodgson. Yes. Yeah, it's it's sweet. It, he's just a very sweet man, and that comes through it. There's a gag about, like, when he's got a date with somebody, and every, uh, the women around him are like, that's just so cute. Oh, and, like, they, they want to kiss him on his forehead, because it's just so, he's just so adorable. <laughs> he's very yeah. adorable in the show. He started performing in 1978 via the band Cats and Jammers, so it's hard to tell what is made up in the history of Dr. Cats. Yeah. Uh, of the man himself because he does lie a lot and in in the form of jokes of course like in the oral history he talks about how he met tom snyder and it's all like a huge lie and then the follow-up question he's like oh i guess i have to be straight on this don't i (laughs) (laughs) yeah he's well he's just such a jokester he is like dad jokes personified in the most innocent of ways but that does make you go like all right is nothing real like what if i were interviewing him i prefer it to being lied to the way that like early Tim and Eric interviews were just them like spitting in your face or whatever with lies. Him, it's too enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was the musical director for Robin Williams 1979 stand-up tour, believe it or not. And he's close friends with David Mamet, who knows if he still is, but Mm -hmm. he wrote the movie House of Games with him and he had small roles in a handful of his movies and of course that's where uh, Tom Snyder saw him. Yeah, I didn't know that until after I was a big time cat's head because he had a cameo. I wasn't watching Mamet movies. I think the first mammoth movie i saw was uh his one about filming in a small town in Hmm. uh, cambridge that like alec baldwin basically plays alec baldwin in it and at the end of the movie like lawyers show up for the movie studio and dr katz is one of them and i'm at jonathan katz is one of them i was like whoa dr katz what's he doing here just completely took me out of the film whenever i see him it takes me out of anything actually the only reason i know david mammoth is because of the mystery science theater song if chauffeurs ruled the world oh 
I don't remember that one. Uh, he'd be like Frank is talking about if chauffeurs ruled the world, then everyone t- would take a back seat to him. No. <laughs> and uh, even even intellectual to respect him, even David Mamet. So, oh, yeah. Yes. He, uh, before he got 9-11 crazy, David Mamet was just like, the, that's a smart uh, writer for stage. That's who, that's who David Mamet is. So he is still performing today, Jonathan Katz. Unfortunately, he was experiencing symptoms of multiple sclerosis Mm -hmm. uh, in 1996. He talked about how uh, he first noticed it when he was on the show Inc., Oh, which I don't man, remember. I it was don't... like a CBS show. I think Ted Danson was in it. Yeah, like I N C period or is it I N K? Yeah, I do not remember this. Um, show. So I guess he was diagnosed with the disease or the syndrome or whatever you want to call it a few years later. But he kept it a secret until the early two thousands. Like the first notice that I got of it in the press when I was doing research was two thousand and three when I was like, "Here's an article. Jonathan Katz is experiencing these problems. Yeah, yeah. He still gets around today with uh, an electric scooter and a cane. He's doing fine." Mm-hmm with the disease so he's, he's hanging in there for a bit yeah. it was kind of scary for me as someone who liked him a lot oh no did you hear that information it's just like well now i look back on that and with when i've seen celebrities i like reveal an illness that is terminal or something when a celebrity lets you know about these things often it is like oh it's it's over like this is how yeah like I, steven hillenberg yeah you heard about it and then it's, they suddenly seem to be dead like a year later yeah seemingly not That's uh, not what's happening with Alex Trebek, and he actually has recovered from what sounded like a very bad prognosis. Uh, and yeah, Jonathan Katz still at it. I I respect him, and he's like his style of comedy can work for it. I think it only gets better the older he gets because he even in the, these shows when he's like forty eight, he's telling such like musty old vaudeville yes. jokes that it works better the older it's he like, gets. You sound so old, and that was twenty five years ago. <laughs> so apparently, Henry, there is a new version of Doctor Katz on Audible. Oh yes, and yeah. you have heard some of this, haven't you? Oh yeah, you want to talk about this now? Yeah, they, yeah, uh, yeah. The the new uh, revival of it as an Audible series. It basically is just built around one guess, and so it's like a seven. It's like one act. So they start out with like an even looser, non scripted scene of uh, cats with somebody else, and then the celebrity, like Ted Danson included, comes on and they just kind of talk. As some people, it is way looser. Like some people are just stand ups who do their stand up, but. It's way more conversational, especially with people who are not professional stand-ups like Danson. It just is like a chat about life, but in the character of of Cats. I think, you know, if you have an Audible membership, you can just hear it. It, uh, You don't even have to pay for it. It's just, you get to uh, listen. Now, uh, the the biggest critique I have of it is that they couldn't really get everybody back together. It's just really Cats, and like sometimes Ben or Laura will call in, but... Other than that, it's 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 really just cats and a celebrity they can get. Do they call in as their characters, though? They do call in as their characters, but they don't really have a handle on what their characters are right now. Or they're like, there's clearly no series Bible written of like, well, for the reboot, Ben is doing this now, or Laura's doing this now, or all these other characters. They just kind of don't care about that, which, like, I get that slapdashedness about it. But it really summed it up for me in one of the episodes early Ben is calling him because they have to do it as a phone call because H. John Benjamin is literally calling in. And then he does a joke about like, I'm 43. Do I still live with you? <laughs> like he doesn't, it, it's him poking holes in it right there. of like, did we decide that I still live with you in this new show or what? Like, and it's funny, but it also, I kind of wish they had that figured out. I do yeah. miss a little more of the formalism of it. It's interesting. I'll have to give that a listen. But it's fun. It's fun. So you mentioned H. John Benjamin. Let's talk about him. So yes. he's now the king of uh, cartoon voiceovers <laughs> with uh, Archer and Bob from Bob's Burger and other mm-hmm. things. Coach McGurk, this was his first voice role. He didn't seemingly care that much about it when he was auditioning. He just was there for Jonathan Katz. Like, mm-hmm. I believe Lauren Bouchard said after the phone call with John Benjamin, he was like, what a dick. This guy sucks. <laughs> he is a, He seems like he's a dick. He's a fun <laughs> dick. I mean, yeah. even when he's Ben, he's he's more of a gentle dick than Bob mm-hmm. from Bob's Burgers. Or Bob is, oh, fine, but like Archer yeah. or Coach McGurk. Archer is more of the dick, I think, Ben. I mean, I do think H. John Benjamin, he's such a funny guy, but a lot of his humor comes out of him being kind of a bully or uh, like rubbing 
building friction against another person. Like uh, he, he's so good with Brandon Small and like them rubbing off of each other mm-hmm. uh, to a more extreme extent. Him and Sam Cedar, I think, have really good chemistry, but also I do think kind of hate, love, hate each other. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason for that. So at the time, he was mostly a sketch and improv performer, mm-hmm. and he was performing in the group uh, Cross Comedy right. with David Cross and Sam Cedar. And I think in the late 90s, he was in a New York group, which is why he was on the Jenny McCarthy show with John oh. Glazer, who was also uh, in that group with him. Fucking love Glazer. Yeah. Like, those two together are so good. Like, God, that Jenny McCarthy show is such a weird... I watched multiple episodes of it because it was like a good sketch show that featured funny people yeah. but it was all just kind of built around the bodacious bod of Jenny McCarthy who could at least like she could pick her nose or whatever and she seemed game with it but she's not like a great comedian and now no. she's crazy so fuck her that but. show had a weird like love boat style intro yes, i remember yeah. too yeah so yeah. uh though you know they didn't do as many jokes about her being sexy as you think they would like the the only ones uh i remember that the gag was brian posein played the mailroom guy oh, he was in that too you're right and you thought he was her stalker, but the joke at the end of it was she was stalking him. I do remember that. Him. For yes, some yeah. reason, I remember that. And there was one sketch where she was in a bikini for some reason, but that really just felt like MTV said, write a goddamn sketch where she's in a bikini. We hired a Playmate supermodel. Get her half naked. <laughs> uh, so John Benjamin originally auditioned to play Dr. Katz's dad, like basically doing an old Jewish man voice. That's crazy. But when he auditioned with Laura Silverman, to do uh, the Ben and Laura kind of dynamic you see on the show, that is when they're like, okay, he's Ben. Yeah. Because he was doing improv with Laura, and they're like, Laura, just be very dismissive. And like, Laura sighs. And I think Ben says, like, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm fat? (laughs) Or something like that. Uh, They they took their dysfunctional real relationship to the stage. Yes. It was so funny. Let's talk about Laura Silverman. So sister Mm -hmm. of Sarah Silverman, and she is cast as Laura, Dr. Katz's dismissive secretary. I had a major crush on Laura watching this show. Uh, I I can see that. (laughs) Totally. So uh, she got the role because John Katz would call Ben and Laura's apartment because he wanted to talk to a comedian that was their roommate, Chuck Sklar. And uh, John Katz would be playful on the phone and tell jokes. She'd just be like, do you want me to leave a message for him or what? (laughs) Like, she would be just as dismissive Uh, with him on the phone. And he was like, that should be her character. It's so funny because she's like... um, her other most famous role is playing a version of herself in the Sarah Silverman program. Yeah. But she's much more like happy and friendly in that. So it's so funny that she is so set as the dark and dour character in this show. It's fun to have her in a scene as sort of like an improv roadblock where she's just like, I don't care. I don't want this. I don't no, care. Go shut away. Shut up. Yeah. Did you shut up? I love when she yeah. says that. I like her for the ice queen that she is. But yeah, Yeah. that's Laura Silverman. And I remember like uh, one of Sarah Silverman's first appearances on SNL was her doing a monologue about her sister's wedding. Yeah. And that was Laura Silverman's wedding in like 1994. Wow. Wow. So, uh, I, or 95, probably 95 or 96. I, I forget that about, Oh, like I just knew her as Laura. I was uh, in the nineties. I was not that interested in finding out who she was. Uh, it only, I think it only hit me that she was Sarah Silverman's sister when the Sarah Silverman program premiered, or maybe uh, some Sarah Silverman stand up. And, and Sarah Silverman was on, on the goddamn show and even did a little scene with Laura where they like give each other nothing and definitely they were internally doing a joke about how they're sisters and then they act like they have no chemistry but I didn't get that back when the episode first aired so Laura plays a much different character today in small doses so her voice is not very recognizable but her and Sarah both play Jimmy Pesto's weird twins on Bob's Burgers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. I didn't know that was them until I saw credits. I was like, oh, shit. I didn't know Laura Silverman is on this show. Yeah, they're putting their um, sibling relationship into a very different place as the uh, the special twins on that show. <laughs> So other people on the show are the folks at the bar. So one of them uh, playing Julie the bartender, also another uh, cartoon crush of mine. Uh, (laughs) So that's Julianne Bond plays Julia. She was an actress friend of Tom's, and he claims that she has a sexy voice, which I agree with. Yeah. Uh, And she was part of the earlier version of the show called The Biography of Mr. Katz, which I believe was like one of the pilots in which she was interviewing Jonathan Katz and setting him up for jokes. Yeah, I, uh, I did give that a little watch, which was interesting because it's like... 
the reverse of the show. He's the comedian on the couch talking to a psychiatrist and giving his bits. But it's also before they discovered mouth movement. So yeah. it is like just the <laughs> open mouths of the characters. They're all Garfielding it up. Um, <laughs> and the other person playing Stanley in the bar is uh, Will LeBeau, another local actor who did a lot of Shakespeare stuff, actually. Really? And uh, again, he plays Stanley, who is somehow even cornier than Dr. Katz. Yeah, boy, they get really corny in those. Yeah. Uh, but I do like the bar scenes a lot. Mm. Although it's funny that the characters can rarely leave that bar. Yeah, there's a bit in here in this episode, Bully, where they're like, oh, they're in the same room as Ben and Laura. That never happened. Yeah, I forgot like, about that. They're trapped in their no exit hell life usually. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's all of the, uh, the main cast. And uh, of course, this show was a showcase for comedians. And the number one comedian on this show didn't stick around for very long, but it was Ray Romano. Mm -hmm. And man, when I first heard Ray Romano in like 1996, when I first saw the show, I'm like, there was nobody funnier yes. than Ray Romano. Ray Romano is going to get his own TV show. I am there. And then I was like, oh, man, this sucks. Yeah, look, as a sitcom, if you're watching a warmed over comfort food sitcom, Everybody Loves Raymond, I think, is a fine one of those to watch. But like, that's what they wanted it to be. Like, they didn't want it to be, they didn't want it to be a sexy show or a one with a will they, won't they, or like, or like a snarky Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah. They just, yeah. it want, he wanted it to be a recurring event of just like, yeah, these, their lives never really change. Things just happen. And, uh, it's it's just about characters hating each other, like in how your family. I mean, intrinsic to Ray Romano's comedy is don't we all hate each other in your family? Yeah, right? but They're it comes from awful. a place of love, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, but Ray Romano, I mean, I will say this is not, this is kind of a diss, but I feel like he only wrote like thirty minutes worth of stand up in his life, but it's a really good thirty minutes, mm. and you'll still hear him tell the same jokes over and over. And most of those I heard for the first time on Doctor Katz, like he's oh, yeah. still doing Doctor Katz material, and he is on one of the commentaries, and it is very candid in which he realizes what his image is now and there is like in this episode there's a premature ejaculation joke and he, you can hear him on the commentary going oh, I wish I could do this joke still oh yes yeah I love that yeah yeah he knows he knows he can't even that kind of gag yeah. is not where he's at now yeah and like he not even that he was a blue comic but him joking about uh, just sex does seem weird for him now and all of the babies he talked about are now almost 30 in this episode oh, god. oh my god yes yeah uh, and they, they still want candy <laughs> uh also in this episode is joy bahar now known as like a real uh anti-trumper i mean who isn't but mm. i think they've come to blows especially via the view oh yes i mean she's been attacked through the tweet storms but also like her job on the view is to yell at megan mccain that's like, great that's that's her main job to be like eh, shut up yeah like, who are you <laughs> who are you yes oh yeah we heard you megan. my father yes we all know uh, your father and then megan will like snarkily say yeah well shut up bitch like yeah like joy bahar is a, a really too much of a hollywood liberal for me like i'm far to the oh, left of her look, but yes, i i yeah. root for her on those view clips i have to watch of her just yelling at megan mccain her and Whoopi are both as far left as you're allowed to be on television yeah. pretty much which is not that left we like, should not be seeing megan mccain never she should not never. be we should not be exposed to her as a people she's no one the only yes. i mean but she's like this is actually a bipartisan thing but rich people just put their kids on tv yeah you just do it you just say well my kid wants to be a tv star okay then i guess they'll be on tv like that's it and so all all she has to do is that and she's like unlikable not even like the the the, the you know what? I, I gotta drop it i'll just talk about megan mccain all day. yeah yeah but fuck her this could be a whole sidebar but yeah. uh yeah so god bless you joy bahar still hanging in there other highlights from the series are todd barry oh, uh god, so yeah. funny on this show no i uh i mean i have a whole well you probably have a list to go through but man i i wrote down just like all these comedians that turned into like these are my favorite alt comedians like this yeah. did set my tastes for comedy more so than like anything else in stand-up it's this, crazy this really told me who to follow and this is why i was so obsessed with stand-ups in the 90s and 2000s like i was so into i followed like all of these people uh andy kindler <laughs> <laughs> i love, love no andy raise Kindle. for you no raise uh, i still love andy Kindle. yeah yeah great. and he was like mostly unknown he was a really a boston comic and uh, i think tom was like 
he said about Andy, he loved watching Andy bomb because his his attitude was like, you don't deserve me. I love that. Yeah. It still is. Still. Uh, of course, we have Dana Gould was on the show. Mm-hmm. Another guy I followed forever. Uh, Jim Gaffigan, who is sort of like a family normie comic, but it's someone I find very, very funny. Still very funny. Yeah. I uh, actually last week just watched, uh, I had not seen it before, but watched for the first time his recent special, which was uh, about, it starts with tell, talking about his wife's tumor surgery mm. and it's pretty it's so great he's like so i could never win in an argument ever again <laughs> he's like you know i never i wasn't winning too many before anyway but now it really can just go like well i did almost die from a tumor you know i was like oh i guess you did huh are you aware of uh, tom papa's Oh, is he still at it? He is like the liquid snake to Jim Gaffigan's solid snake. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> or the know. other way around. I mean, like, they are so identical in how they look and perform. Oh, yes. Yeah. But uh, are, yeah. I don't know why I brought that up. I just feel like, is he cloned? Was he like uh, a failed clone? Yeah. I mean, well, that would make Jim the, the solid of the two. I That's think. true. Yeah. That's true. Uh, also, uh, Dom Herrera had a really fun relationship with Cats on the show. Yeah. He, uh, wh- listeners heard his voice in the um, Captain Simeon and the Space Monkeys episode. Oh, you're did. right. That's right. That was him. I, th- I believe we had to talk about cats on that. Of mm-hmm. course, uh, Kevin Meany, always funny, all the R. screaming. R. Yeah, God. He, could, he was under so many blankets. <laughs> it's not right. Yeah. And uh, a big sigh comes with Louis C.K. The first time I saw him uh, and yes. uh, followed him because of that and uh, was very disappointed by him in the future. I loved his stand up so much on this show. Like his his story about the dream he had where he's making out with men, or, and he's like, Yeah, I realize, like, no, this is gay. Or his, his story about chips ahoy ice cream yeah yeah like that really that made me <laughs> laugh he i you know now i look back on it i think his bits were funnier before he had kids but his his reinvention as the guy who says his kids suck that that changed him and like uh, yeah, yeah. And, now, like, and now like fuck him but i i mean i could go deeper into why fuck him but like, it's weird that uh i mean you're talking about this before henry that before I don't think we're as into stand-up comedy because there was this attitude before, like, stand-ups can change the world, man. They're yeah. telling the truth. But now I'm just like, all the stand-ups, well, not all of them, but too many of the stand-ups I used to love are now on, like, hosting a Netflix shows called, like, The Triggered Safe Space Alert or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, like, all about a rich person being challenged and upset <laughs> with that. Yeah, it just, it makes it, well, they also just all became less personable. They all, like, yeah. through fame and age and, and uh, uh, getting older and also having kids who disagree with them like they all they hate that like even Seinfeld like he hates having a child who disagrees with him and he kind of complains about that on stage but same with I mean CK especially really shattered a lot of uh my faith in the art of stand-up, I guess, or at least the way that I let them get built up as gods in my mind, because CK throughout, like, say, the Obama administration, he pretty much was presented as CK tells the truth. Oh, my God. Like, we're all, like, learning so much. Like, in his his show, by not being funny, <laughs> actually changed the way we all thought of things. It's too smart to be funny, like Family Guy said about <laughs> Sports Night. <laughs> and it was such great branding as a truth teller that then when you find out that in actuality he had been working very hard to hide all truth about him through intimidation and lies that you realize like oh this was like a total brand and I fell for it and Mm -hmm. maybe truth is nothing like it makes you it shakes your whole belief in reality and like I do think being a comedian is more than being funny and saying a funny thing and I think a lot of it is like what I love about comedy is the ability to say truth to power but i think it also empowers a lot of assholes to be pieces of shit and uh and the more powerful they get thanks to being it, your ability to tell truth is not what made louis ck popular more so than his charisma and yeah that charisma was then turned into evil actions i think so it's uh one thing that i've been disappointed by people people like Patton oswald and others have not disappointed me but i think yeah. one of the reasons i fell out of and this is therapy for me one of the reasons <laughs> i fell out of uh getting into stand-up like in the 90s and 2000s i watched hours of stand-up i would just leave on comedy central and watch all the stand of the premium blends and all those mm. shows but I think when podcasts came around, I started getting more into sketch and improv yeah. and respecting people more as I became a podcaster, respecting performers more who had to improvise on the spot and have, be funny on the spot and come up with an opinion on the spot. Like I started focusing on that because that was my new role in life. I'm not an improv comedian. I'm not a comedian, but I have to be funny and entertaining on podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it gave me a different appreciation and I could see more so that I learned about the craft of like, I think a big misunderstanding people have of all stand 
stand up and why they, I think, maybe give a different power to stand up than they should is like it's all a performance. These are it is a performed, rehearsed thing learned over tons of time. And part of the act is making people think you're just thinking of it right now and you're saying it to your friend. That's part of the live stand up and what makes it so attractive. But if you trick yourself into thinking it is, you know, this amazing thought that's being come up with right then by like this sage on stage, it really aggrandizes things that are are lesser than that. I, I don't know. It, I've lost a lot of faith in stand up in general, I have to say. I mean, I see more of the artifice of it now. And I think, too, this is an uncanceled person, but he's a big reason I don't like stand up now, too, is Pete Holmes and the Pete oh, Holmes yeah. of the world who are just like guys who wanted to become an influencer through that way and they just want it's and it's just a search for fame by preparing a persona that you are like i don't i don't find pete holmes very funny i think his podcast is uh at best he gets somebody who will admit things about their life that's interesting and he can just laugh over them and not let them talk and be mm. annoying and even then it's just him doing a marin impersonation and then when he got his own show like a real thing that summed him up for me is that like pete Pete Holmes' most attractive ability is to be able to convince guys like Conan O'Brien and Judd Apatow that they were just like him when they were younger, <laughs> and they can relive through him. Like, so that's yeah. a that's a wag of the finger to Pete Holmes. Yeah, he saw. Yeah. Well, I also uh, to make this about Doctor Katz too. Thank you. <laughs> in 2015 uh, at SF Sketchfest, they did a 20th anniversary reunion thing oh, with, uh, for, for Katz. It was really great. It sold out really fast, but uh, I did attend that, and it was really great. And they've done a lot of these. Actually, the Audible show is sort of done through Sketchfest, sort of. I believe they record them during Sketchfest. It's it got restarted. It's tangentially related to it, but uh, at the 2015 show, it was really great. H. John Benjamin was there in person. Laura Silverman actually called in uh, for the very start of it. Jonathan Katz was seated the whole time. They had a couch set up, and Tom Snyder was there playing the music live to take them in and out of scenes. It was really really funny. Morgan, they had uh, Emo Phillips come back to do his stuff, and that was really great. Uh, and then the young people were Ron Funches, who ruled, Morgan Murphy, who was very funny, and then Pete Holmes, who was very annoying, Aww. and um, completely just giggled to himself the whole time and removed the artifice of it and was like sort of fanboying out, but he's like, oh my God, you never know what a fan I was. I was like, shut the fuck up. He's fallening it up all it, over that stage. It really sucked. That was the only part of it that sucked, but the rest was funny and addendum to that story is that a year later in 2016 at a Star Trek convention of all places, <laughs> I got to meet Emo Phillips because um, his wife was an actress in Star Trek so in some Star Trek thing and so he's just the husband with the famous person at Star Trek but I was like, is that Emo Phillips? Because Emo Secret, that's a wig he wears. What? So when he's walking around with normal hair, you don't instantly think that's Emo Phillips. Is that his real voice? Um, eh, you Hello, know, Henry. a little bit. Uh, but he was very friendly. He he was a little aloof, as you'd want from Emo Phillips. Yeah, person. yeah. But he was very friendly. It, uh, I met his wife first because uh, the site I was there with was kind of working with her. And so she was super friendly and nice. I was like, oh, so nice to meet you. And then I was like... That's when I realized who her was with her. I was like, is, is that Emo Phillips? She's like, oh, yeah, that's my husband. You want to meet him? He loves meeting fans. Oh, and that's cute. She was very nice, too. Uh, so, yes. He's uh, great on the show. <laughs> yeah. uh, one thing, this is going on a bit long, but one thing I wanted to establish in the context, which I should have done up front, is that Dr. Katz arrived at a very perfect time for this show to be produced and that the stand-up comedy boom was still happening. Mm -hmm. And also there was a psychiatry boom oh, yeah, in that yeah. psychiatry was now a thing that, quote-unquote, normal people could do. There was a an interest in seeing a psychiatrist which is why like there's no uh there's no coincidence that Frasier was a show oh yes, like, yeah like alongside Dr. Katz and other things like that like I feel like that was the perfect confluence of these two trends mm -hmm. in culture it just wasn't for rich New Yorkers anymore yeah and, and or jokes in the New Yorker anymore yeah. uh yeah oh two more I wanted to name that I loved in this old show were he uh, Mitch Hedberg who I did get to see live uh and David Tell who I also saw live like he's so funny on 
on the show. He's one of the few they redrew, and he made a later appearance. Of like, oh, this doesn't look like Dave Attell anymore. They made Ray Romano a lot fatter for a second appearance. Yeah, that shocked me when yeah. I saw him on Everybody Loves Raymond. Like, I don't know if he's ever been as fat as they draw him in that show. And Wanda Sykes too. She was another fan. Yeah, of mine. she was really yeah. good on that. So I want to make a production note about this podcast. So we normally put music from the show in the podcast. Unfortunately. Dr. Katz has one song and parts of that song are chopped up to be like bumper music and stuff like that. So you'll hear that song at the end, but I had to find similar music. And for me personally, the music in Dr. Katz reminds me of the music from SimCity 2000 for the PC and that it wow. is white guy jazz. That uh, sums it up pretty well. So yeah, that yeah. is the music you'll hear on the way into the break and out of the break, just so you're not confused. But yes, yeah. we're going to go to break right now and come back with a discussion of the Dr. Katz episode, Bully. Dr. Cap. Tell me about your early childhood. Whatever you remember. I, I, I went to Catholic grade school, you know, and the one thing that nuns hated being called more than anything else, Doc, my man. They hated that. I used to constantly refer to them as Sister, my man, my main man, Sister. Sister, man, my main, Michael Vincent, my man, Sister, my man. I would get in a lot of trouble with that. He's Dr. Katz, professional therapist, and you can find him only at Comedy Central, Sundays at 10.30 p.m. Hey everybody, welcome to the What A Cartoon Break and put the iPhone down because we have a special announcement for you. Isn't that right, Henry? Yeah, that's right. And hey, I think I'm falling hard for Dr. Katz. (laughs) Cha-cha-cha. Oh boy. (laughs) But yeah, it's hey. Deep breaths. uh, Thanks for listening to this. We, uh, Boy, the What a Cartoon podcast, just like Talking Simpsons, is supported by patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And you get so many exclusives, including one that just got decided by our voters on Patreon. That's right. This is breaking news. This just in. So $5 patrons at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons have access so far to Talking Critic, Talking of the Hill, and the first season of Talking Futurama. But we just had our vote for our second miniseries of 2019, and our lovely patrons voted for season two, part one of Futurama. So soon... Very soon, you'll be getting 10 new miniseries episodes if you're signed up at the $5 level at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. Mm-hmm. They're all exclusive podcasts only for you listeners at the Patreon. So please consider signing up for that and supporting us because me and Bob do this full time. We're only able to do it thanks to the support of folks like you. But you also get so much for your five bucks and you get even more for $10 a month. If you enjoy What a Cartoon you could hear us talk about a different animated feature film once a month with the What a Cartoon Movie podcast. This month in September, we're doing the Cowboy Bebop movie, Knocking on Heaven's Door. Before that, we've done over 24 hours of What a Cartoon movies that'll be available to you if you sign up at the $10 level. Movies like Tiny Toons, How I Spent My Vacation, Kiki's Delivery Service, A Goofy Movie, Aladdin. Rocco's Modern Life Static Cling. Too many to list here, but a ton of ones will be available to you whether you sign up at 10 bucks at the start or if you take your $5 pledge up to 10 bucks a month. It's totally worth your while there. Yes, and in case you're new to the whole Patreon game, it's super easy to sign up for. And if you sign up, you get a nice little code. You can drop that into whatever you use to listen to the podcast or use uh, Patreon's app to listen to us. Either way, you can fit us alongside your normal free podcasting lifestyle. And again, that is at Patreon. Dot com slash Talking Simpsons. So thanks for listening to this break, and we'll let you get back to the Dr. Katz Professional Therapist episode, Bully. So we're back with the Dr. Katz episode, Bully. This episode aired on June 11th, 1995, and it is the third episode of Dr. Katz. 
and the entire plot revolves around Ben being a man baby, which is the point of most of the plots. <laughs> I was 12 when I saw this, and now I think of impressionable 12 year old Henry seeing the like, oh, I could be a man child and, and still live at home in my 20s. Hmm. Seemed pretty nice. Yeah, it seems like a pretty good deal. <laughs> but in this intro uh, bit, Ben sees his precious stuffed animal sitting on a dumpster. Mm-hmm. John pulls up in the car, Dr. Katz, of course, and is wondering what's going on. And apparently, Dr. Katz gave his housekeeper the orders to clean out the linen closet, and Bully was in there, and Ben (laughs) is traumatized. Uh, How could you? I mean, you know Bully is my favorite stuffed animal. It has been since I was two. How do you let this happen? Let me ask you something, Ben. When was the last time you spent any time with Bully, if it's your favorite stuffed animal? Oh, that's none of your business, how much time I spend with Bully. Okay, Ben, I don't have time to discuss this now. Clean yourself off. Well, I'm just, you better think twice next time about about this, Dad, because this, this isn't good. You know, I'm, this I'm, isn't I'm, good. I've got to tell you, I'm a little embarrassed sitting here talking to a guy in the dumpster. Can we continue this conversation later? Well, I guess I just expect an apology, Dad, because, you know, it just shows, I guess, a lack of consideration well, for my should stuff. I apologize for trying to create an, an environment in which two adults can live? Oh, what are you trying to say, that because I have a stuffed animal, I'm not adult? I think you said it eloquently. <laughs> no, all I'm saying is that... that that we need the use of that closet, Ben. I have human friends, too. Well, do you keep them in the linen closet? Would you throw them out? Touche, so. my young son. <laughs> so that is the real uh, vocal delivery style of Dr. Katz. Lots of crosstalk, lots of uh, dead air, lots of stammering. It's, it's yeah. very enchanting. Yeah, I love, I love that. Uh, when you can hear them crosstalk over each other, also um, Ben, like... One of them will try to do a setup for a joke, but like the other will talk over them and prevent them from telling their joke. And I could see, you know, for some listeners, that could also be frustrating of like, tell your joke. Yes. I wanted to hear it. Spit it out. Uh, yeah. But, you know, when I lo- watched the first season, this is definitely the most ambitious of their first season ones. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they did never. I mean, they never got super sappy, but I love the more emotional ties mm-hmm. that they would do, the more emotional stories. And this one, I kind of get goosebumps during one point of this episode where uh, mm-hmm. there is a bit of tragedy in their lives. Mm-hmm. And Ben is a tra- like a quietly a tragic character. It's like this little boy who never grew up and never will. And his father is too soft to actually force him to do anything. So there's all these little comments like, Ben, you ever think about, you know, leaving the house maybe mm-hmm. and, you know, getting friends or a job yeah. of just that this this whole episode episode here comes from Katz realizing like I need to at least push him as lightly as possible and one of those things is to throw out old toys he doesn't use anymore and his re- Ben's reaction to this little thing was to scrounge in the dumpster yeah. and grab his, it covered in germs now his beloved bully uh, toy because Ben is a uh, he's not a great guy really I mean uh, he's quietly just a, an asshole loser but he's so gentle and lovable I don't know how this show makes him appealing because he's kind of just a scoundrel but yeah. he's also also very loving to his father and they have a good relationship but i do like how dr katz will often say ben will do something stupid or crazy or naive or think he's going to start a new career or job opportunity He'll be like you know you know ben is this something that people should be doing like just like <laughs> gentle question it's like do you think a regular person would do this do you do you remember when you did this yeah so well, I like just little moments like, like yeah. that. Yeah. How do you think this will be different, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> that are like softly taking you through what you know is going to happen, which, you know, in so many shows, it's about the the father-son dynamic is just the father is harsh to the son or just like how, uh, you know, and this, this is a home improvement era, too, of just like a tough dad who's teaching his son to be men again, you know, in a world full of wusses. And then meanwhile, you have cats who is like the wussiest wuss <laughs> the world just softening people up so maybe this is also a condemnation of that wussiness as well maybe. they do lean into it i do like when they actually argue on the show and ben is screaming but cats is just still very gentle yes yeah. he gets like kind of like uh still like sarcastic but that's it yeah he's like well i'll show you something here. hey oh hey i i like uh, another bit at the very start of this is how the acting by ben just the way he makes noises like well, why? What, yeah. Why? Why? That's they. You can tell the setup was just they told H. John Benjamin, "Well, you discover this. What? Uh, you discover your favorite stuffed animal in the garbage. How do you react?" And that he just builds it of like, 
what what like he's he was given enough leeway of like have this extreme reaction and that creates who the character of ben is like the character of ben is found over time yeah yeah he says things in this that uh have less give him less loser dumb than he would normally have and these things just kind of fall away like when he says i have human friends too in later episodes he'd say that knowing he's lying yeah that is not true (laughs) but i think the character of ben as he sees it then is a guy who has human friends like the only friend they gave him in the later seasons was his video store clerk played by todd barry who's so funny but he also is like it it cast Ben as the loser who's always at the video store who thinks the employee that's forced to talk to you is your friend. That does make it more tragic. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> he would find Ben a little more in the future, but I think they nailed down the basic elements of Ben mm-hmm. in this episode. This is a primordial Ben moment that he is somebody who holds on to his childhood this brokenly and this sadly, and also that he's someone who has a capacity for such extreme reactions mm-hmm. instead of just uh, quiet, uh, quiet reactions to cats also the ambition of this compared to the other episodes like they draw two new locations in this so they can't just cycle through old backgrounds yeah yeah there's the alley and the club mm-hmm. too so yeah. they're being very ambitious with these two new backgrounds <laughs> by, by dr cat stand yeah yeah, yeah. I, they draw them in a car and everything and when i think about this show as a stand-up showcase like i like how ambitious they are to tell stories in it too and to give stories to other characters like Unlike on a similar show to this, like Shorty's Watching Shorty. I was just going to say that. Oh, God. <laughs> Which that that stars uh, the king of a triggered much content, uh, Nick DiPaolo. Oh, like, he was in that. Yeah. I mean, the star was Nick DiPaolo uh, with Patrice O'Neill, who were R- he still. R.I.P. Uh, yeah. I do wonder if he was alive today where he'd be standing in the uh, pantheon of triggered much stand-ups. But also, I mean, Patrice O'Neill himself would call himself a misogynist, so I wouldn't be going wrong. Yeah, what a weird uh, weird sidebar. That was a weird show where it's like it was the Dr. Cat's idea with technically much better animation, but the framing device was bizarre and stupid. Yes, yeah. It was such a scatological show, which did make it fit more with the, you know, man show, Crank Yankers era of Comedy Central, so I get why they did it, but like the opening of the show is diapers filling with shit to That's let you true. know where the stuff... I remember I did laugh at a Dane Cook show through the context of Shorty's watching Shorty's. Oh, he's scrubbing I laugh- his balls? Yes, I laughed yeah. at a Dane Cook joke because the animation was funny. Then I realized yeah. what I was laughing at and I felt very bad. The show was cheaper and less work intensive than Dr. Cats 2 because they wouldn't even record new things. They would just take the pure audio from a stand-up oh, performance you're right. and put yeah. it in the show. Uh, but Mitch Hedberg was on it, and he did the Bush table for three. Well, like, no, let's start a search party, that whole bit. They did the same bit on there, except it was animated more extremely, but they took an extra leap of, like, he said one of the families was Bush, so they drew the Bush family, oh, as great. in George Bush, H.W. Bush, I all guess those it was people. 2004. I mean, we could see the return of Shorties Watching Shorties, because <laughs> for whatever fucking reason, Crank Yankers is coming yes, back. Yeah, even, even with Adam Carolla, which is just uh, like no, no. Yeah, yeah. Not I'm sorry. Him. Let's not let's not bring the show down with this talk of crank yanking. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the first patient is Ray Romano. So uh, part of this podcast is going to be us awkwardly summarizing stand up bits. So I've flipped like about half the stand up bits, but the first part is it's funny to think about Ray Romano as like a young non celebrity who is I think younger than us when recording this. Mm. Yeah, I bet you're right. I think he was younger than us. But the first oh, God. the first bits are about, I mean, his stand-up is about, like, starting a family. And that's what the entire TV mm-hmm. show Everyone Loves Raymond, sorry, Everybody Loves Raymond, <laughs> was based about. But the first bit I thought was still very funny. It's like, when you move in with your wife, well, number one, you should live together first. I think our generation is really down with that more oh, than yeah. Ray's was. Yeah. But it's like the decisions you make on the first day, you're locked in for life. Like, which side of the bed you're on? And I found that, like, this, this observational comedy is still very resonant today. Like, yes, I think about that all the time. Like, mm-hmm. with previous partners, I was the guy who slept by the door because of the boogeyman. <laughs> that's so funny yeah i was thinking of this too in my current relationship when it started and i was thinking about where do i want to sleep and this echoed in my brain this bit about choosing where to sit and being careful with that or lay down so 
in my current apartment, I locked in my side of the bed with my former uh, partner, and that was next to the door, where it's mm. like, of course, the boogeyman will come in that way. I'll protect you. And I, was, I always think of that joke, too. But when <laughs> I stay at my new girlfriend's place, I thought, no, this time I'm going to shake things up. I don't sleep by the door. And it's messed up my life ever since because <laughs> her bed is just a, uh, like, there's no, it's not up off the ground. It's like on the ground. It's not a mattress oh. on the ground, but it's a bed on the ground. I see. Not right. Um, so I am huge and it takes me forever to climb over her and get out of it. So I fucked myself <laughs> over by letting her, and she's also tougher than me. She could take on the boogeyman. Yeah. Well, then she should be close to the door for that yeah. reason then. But you saw my old place, Bob, when, when I lived alone, my bed was like an extra foot off the ground from the normal height. Just yeah. I like looking down at the TV from there. And I mean, the thing about getting out of bed is like in the morning, you just want gravity to carry you mm-hmm. instead of having to like climb up off the ground and like rise oh, yeah. up like a the vampire extra lift yeah my god don't like that yeah. see ray gave us a lot to talk about he did yeah. but uh here is him talking about his new role as a husband in the new house yeah well i found out all the roles that i was gonna play right after i got married you know you think you know them all you think oh it's take out the garbage and mow the lawn those are the traditional roles right after i got married i found out that in the middle of the night i was now the automatic noise checker outer Every little thing. What was that? No, it's nothing. Oh, check it out. Check it out. What do you mean, nothing? Uh, That could be a burglar with a gun. So be careful. Go. Watch out. Put your slippers on. You might have to run. Bring me up a yogurt if it's nothing. Either way. I want a yogurt either way. (laughs) Don't come back without a yogurt slipper, boy. Oh, so so you're the the noise checker. (laughs) <laughs> it's so fun to, as someone who edits podcasts it's so fun to hear like oh boy I would have clipped so much of that silence out but it's mm-hmm. it's so nice how it's just allowed to sit there and the, yeah. the images you see that you're not seeing on the podcast they really fill out the silence mm-hmm. the, the rhythm of it is important with the silence and like I do wonder ever if People were insulted by who they would, how they would draw a relative or a wife, yeah. like like unflattering wives on this yeah. show. Despite the art director being a woman, it's like yeah. this is the wife with like the green face mask and uh, like hair and curlers yeah, or whatever, the, like pink bathrobe. And uh, Joy Bahar's mom later in the thing is also just such a random character. Like it, though, that was part of the fun too of seeing how they draw somebody like the. Uh, I forget which comedian did it, but the one about calling up the Cool Whip guy. <laughs> and then what the artists imagine what the Cool Whip guy looked like. And or, uh, the drawing of Jim Gaffigan's manatee. Oh, yeah. On the so talk I, show. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, sorry. I'm going to sleep in the water because that's where I'm warm. I'm a manatee. Yeah. Uh, the, or also the. Uh, I think it was Kevin Meany describing a guy who's like uh, an, an uncle of his who just ate was huge and fat and ate hot dogs and his skin <laughs> was like hot dog skin. That's uh, a really good drawing too. But the uh, me and my husband are deep sleepers, so I'm not. Nobody does a noise checker out. Though also, mm. these jokes don't work on non homeowners because it's like. Well, where was the noise? Uh, in the one room outside of here. Well, I can just look. There's no one in the kitchen. Yeah, look, I can see my entire apartment just like, peeking at the door. <laughs> Ray Romano with all these rooms. No having to go downstairs. Like, the man, I bet, you know, noise checker out or if you live in a home with a gun, it's more important than you think. Because yes. Because you might just murder a child. Yes. That so, or a loved one coming home to surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> that just happened. So, uh, we go back to the cat's residence and Ben is overreacting in his room full of trash. He's got a real label system in play here. So so it's a great it's a great improv scene where uh, John Benjamin is thinking like what labels can mean mm-hmm. in the context of this scene. So red ones is like don't remove from his room. Yellow is don't remove from the house. Green is they can leave the house, but you can't get them away. <laughs> and beige labels uh, means that he doesn't actually own the items. So you know you it, can't get yeah. away. You got to talk to that guy. Yeah, and then all the. Uh, it's where the artist really takes some liberties too of like what those items would be. Yeah, I don't think they actually make a beige label though. Oh yeah, no, I think in their color scheme it'd be hard to do. Yeah, like, I was looking around at like the details of Ben's room, and I think they they didn't know what his character would be either. Later, like he has, it's like toys. Yeah, like, there's like a toy chest in there. There's like 
posters of like BMX racers on the wall, which I think the implication in general is he is living in the room he grew up in still and hasn't really changed anything since he was yeah. 12. Like in my in my 20s, I could go in my closet and be like, oh, here are all the toys I played with a decade ago because, mm. I mean, I hadn't been alive that long. <laughs> I have given my mom permission to throw away my old toys now. She's mm. very nicely kept them in the garage of my stepdad, but I just feel bad for my stepdad that he's like, he's such a nice guy. Like he and he, he is a Dr. Katz type, actually, even hairline kind of. But I feel bad that his nice garage is filled with like four <laughs> uh, plastic tubs of my toys. When it's like, you didn't even raise me. What do you give a shit about <laughs> these toys? He inherited those. Yeah, yeah. But did you have a bully growing up, like as in your um, favorite stuffed animal? Yes, I did. I had a stuffed tiger, not unlike Hobbs. Mm. And it was actually from the Hanna Barbera show Shirt Tales. Whoa. The tiger from Shirt Tales. I didn't like Shirt Tales. I never watched it, but (laughs) I was given a stuffed tiger probably because I was at the dollar store or something. But uh, (laughs) I I think I still have it at my mom's place. Yeah. Boy, I think I think all my stuffed animals were finally lost because they just got so oh yeah, I think like water damage happened to them thanks to like uh, you know, that terrible Florida weather. But uh, growing up, so I think until I was five my favorite was like for real a Garfield. Like it was, and it was a purchased in 1982 fat Garfield, not the cooler Garfields. Then for a little while, it was, uh, I believe, Tender Heart to the Care Bear. That was my favorite. And then after that, my bully became this, this like unnamed fox, stuffed fox that looked like he was from like a Jim Davis design, but he wasn't from anything. Interesting. Just a cute little plump fox. And now, so. now I'm looking at pictures of this guy online. I could buy a new one. Oh, man. A fresher can, one. My, my old one. All day. My old one is so grody, though. <laughs> but yeah, shirt uh, tails. What a weird pull. I don't know why. Yeah. I had a friend, adult friend, who just a couple years ago, uh, she still had her, the grumpy Care Bear, the storm cloud one. Man, what was his name? Anyway, she had that one since she was a child. And then for Halloween, she went as that Care Bear, like in, in an outfit and walked around with her stuffed Care Bear. It was crazy. I think my sister, uh, being a basic B, she had a Winnie the Pooh stuffed animal. Oh, I was, I was off. I was off the map there with t- uh, Shirt Tails guy. <laughs> yeah, you were you were going to the more obscure niche thing. As, yep. as, as, <laughs> as, that's the difference between you guys still. It defines you to this. It, it really does. Uh, yeah, and so I can understand Ben's love of bully. When I was twenty five, if that fox toy was going to be sold. Uh, thrown out i would have been very upset by that like i think the only thing that gave me an easy clear cut on that was finally moving away and leaving all that stuff there so if something happened it'd be like well i'm not home like so oh well it's the same with like uh i'm very sad my pets are dead now but i didn't have to see it happen so it was a nice nice from yeah i moved away and then all the pets died so uh (laughs) i missed that i missed that train Mm -hmm. so meanwhile ben is feeling abandonment issues what is it you're what what is it you're saying here, Ben? You're, well, maybe it's not just about bully. Yeah. yeah, maybe maybe by you throwing out bully, you're giving me a signal that uh, maybe I'm next. Maybe you throw me out. Maybe I I leave. Ben, have I ever put any pressure on you to leave this house, to move out, to live the life of a young adult? <laughs> um, have I ever suggested that I could use this as my office? <laughs> And maybe a little uh, like an upright piano. Have I ever, in a, in a zillion years, suggested to you that your presence in my life is anything but rewarding? So don't don't go reading stuff into this. So so you you don't you don't want me out. I don't want you out, Ben. I mean, at some point you will spread wings and fly. Right. You know, you will want to be out on your own someday, and and you'll know when that day is. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly. I'll fly. <laughs> you know I will. You put a, I noticed you put a red label on your labels. That what remind me what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, so we all know Ben is stuck. Uh, he's not going nowhere. Yeah, that's such a great delivery by Ben of just like I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna fly. I'm gonna fly. Like he's he it's a lie he can barely even put I mean, up for his dad. Dr. Katz is lying to himself. He's like, We well, you know one day, Ben, you're gonna leave this house. <laughs> <laughs> They're all just talking theoretically. Yeah. Like, yes. Yeah, over time on the show we'll be proven that Ben cannot get a job for one day. Like yeah. he simply can't do it. It's and, a it's the lighter side of a codependent relationship, this show. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that is a big part. I think that's what they figured out very quickly on the show, that it's just like, because 
sometimes you get the feeling that Dr. Katz wants Ben to move out, but other times you see that like he's a lonely man who doesn't have anything else going on. Yeah. Like there's very few romantic prospects for both Ben oh, and yeah. uh, Dr. Katz. Well, and there's a whole history. There's like multiple episodes of just like they go to movies too often and they just constantly see movies together. That's the plot. They're just losers <laughs> who uh, support each other. I mean, the codependent cuteness of it, I love that shot of them sitting on the bed together that they both are like yeah. kind of plump and weird. Like that they're cute and, and plump and weird and just talking about plans that will never happen. Like that's like, yeah. Uh, the low key hangout scenes are my favorite. Like the episodes usually begin with that. Like they're, they're making breakfast or they're on the couch mm-hmm. to set up the plot. It's very cute and sweet and low key. In some looser episodes, this really would be the end of one of the plots and they just have a different solo scene plot going on, which a B plot does show up, but then it I uh, will get to it. But I like how they show that this isn't really the ending of the bully yeah. plot here. Speaking of bully on the show, they I don't think he was ever spoken of again, but I do think the animators drew him in a lot. I think they liked yeah, bully more. He was sort of the Bobo yeah. <laughs> of uh, the Cats universe. I was watching one episode called Paranoia where they – it's actually a noise checker outer scene where they hear a noise in their apartment and they think someone's trying to break in. Through no part of dialogue is it implied Ben is holding bully, but the animators were like, well, the joke is Ben was woken up in the middle of the night and is terrified and is hugging his stuffed animal. And he's like, even there's a joke of like, oh, we should check in the hallway. And he uses, he puts bully out in the hallway first to look. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, Top Snyder admitted the animators added a lot of their own jokes and mm-hmm. it didn't really annoy him. I think it would annoy the home movies people. Yeah. More. Yeah. But I think Lauren Bouchard has more of a vision and has more of a script for his stuff than Tom Snyder did. I think Tom Snyder was much more hands off with. Which I think for an animated program, probably you should have at the lead a person who cares about what's drawn. Uh, but I, the laissez faire attitude that he has is kind of fun, but definitely like Brandon Small was like, that drawing sucks, or this character, yeah. or they added a joke that I would have never put in here, yeah. which completely changes the tone, which absolutely happened all the time in Dr. Katz. Like a comedian's joke would be meant to end where the comedian did it and they're like well but wouldn't it be funny if i drew his wife looking at him weird in the next shot like yeah which tonally affects uh, any of the comedy there are some hits and misses but you're speaking yeah. of laissez-faire the next scene is such a long sleepy scene that i kind of love where the first half of the the first half of it that I didn't clip is just Dr. Katz and Ben are pl- are hanging out in the living room. Oh, yes. And yeah. Katz is just playing guitar and annoying Ben while he's trying to read, like, weekly world news. <laughs> and uh, he wants to turn, and it's been a long night, too much excitement. First the chicken pot pie, now the song. I love that. And then we eventually get to the point of this scene. I love how it's just, like, okay, uh, Ben and Katz annoy each other, and then immediately, like, find the the point in the improv where we got to transition to the actual script or the mm-hmm. actual point of the scene. So, oh, by the way, I love in the recordings... Tom Snyder always points out they left in when uh, H. John Benjamin would laugh at Jonathan Katz yeah, because yeah. it felt really natural. So this scene starts with him laughing <laughs> at something that Katz does. Hey, you know, Dad, as opposed, yeah. as opposed to playing uh, to me every night, you maybe you should, you're, you're good. Maybe you should go to, like, I know a couple places that have open mic nights. What's... You, you go, you, you sign up, and you, and you play uh-huh. in front of an, an audience. And that well, would... I'm, not, I'm not in that league. <laughs> These guys are guys who do nothing but play the guitar. And, you know, I, this for me is just a hobby. No, no, no. But what would I sing? Do you need to sing original songs? Because I haven't written a song in 20 years. That's all folk. No, it's, uh, a, it's all folk music? It's all folk. It's all, uh, no, do you, you know... think I'm that good that I could get up there and, and keep an audience captivated? No. On the edge of their seat? <laughs> um... I mean, I think you're capable enough uh, to, uh, to yeah, make an impression on uh, people. Ben, thank you for your support. Oh. Yeah. Jimmy Crack Coon and I don't care. No, don't, don't. Jimmy Crack Coon and I don't care. Remember what you used to think it was called, Jimmy Crack Corn? Yes, uh, I do, yeah. When you were little? Yeah. Amy Ack on. Remember that? <laughs> Amy Ack. Ben, where are you going? <laughs> I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm, uh, like, I'm, I'm a little uh, bloated. <laughs> Let's get into that scene. Uh, I like just how uh, meandering and gentle it all is. It's like a kind of comedy and a kind of like television you don't really see anymore. 
and I, as a comedy snob, I, I've lightened on this, but as a comedy snob, I used to hate guitar comedians. Mm. Like it felt, it felt like a crutch to me, and to add a pattern to stuff that maybe aren't are jokes that could not stand on their own. You know, which I don't think Cats is guilty of that, but like it would always bother me a little of like. Well, Dan Mintz was funny enough, and now he's picking up a guitar for the end of this? Why? Why? The same with, like, my, my detested Pete Holmes was also one of those pick-up-a-guitar guys. It's more like noodling in the back of improv, though. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but, which I like. But I also like that they buy... Th- this is the third episode, right? Like, so already they're like, I know you're Dr. Katz, but let's just do your stand up on stage in character yeah. like your character plays the guitar and just does it and it was easy for john Katz to play this role because it was basically his biography like <laughs> he lived this life uh i love that outside I love of that being a doctor him. yeah i i love to think that dr Katz also learned how to all this folksy bullshit music living in like a hippie commune kind of thing and that's part of his character i like the chicken pot pie was excited described as exciting uh <laughs> A Snoopy Dog Dog reference, not so into yeah. that. But that's part of the corniness of Dr. Katz, though, yeah, the character. Yeah. And but that was that was a topical joke in 95. It was. To reference yeah. Snoop Doggy Dog. <laughs> uh, and the Buckinghams broke up in 1970. I mm. looked that up. So uh, that's a long time. They Their most famous song is kind of a drag when I sit oh, okay. around with you. I but, guess I forgot that this scene ends with uh, Katz imagining himself playing in front of a crowd. He's like, mm-hmm. I've been hurt so many times. Four, folks, four times. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the what's great about his noodling is that he does do this on stage a ton too not just for this episode but like it's the promise that he's about to sing a song he's like i'm totally gonna sing a song but you know it makes me think and it yeah. just, it's all these asides and uh all the you, storytelling you, you just giggle songs. to yourself of like he's delaying this song again he's still not gonna sing the song it feels very realistic of a father and son or a parent and child where the child is like, I'm so annoyed by what you do, but you love doing it, so I don't want to really insult yeah, you. Yeah, I just want you to do it out of the house. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a subtext here in that uh, Ben was traumatized at first because of the bully thing, and he got over that. Mm. But now Katz is the guy who's thinking like, oh no, what if my son does leave? And he's thinking about his son, and they're like uh, much happier times together. Yeah, it's true. You know, he's playing the guitar because he's remembering the his childhood and he's like oh remember this song when you were a kid remember this which uh, and he also says you know i started playing it when i met your mother in school which i think they kind of dropped that background like if they ever give a detail on a character who will later show up and be not respected at all it's just because they they didn't know these things it was just said in a scene to set it up i I really there's a couple bad drawings the the drawing of the bored audience and yeah Katz's imagination that kind of sucks it's but. not a fun psych gag where uh, they're talking about how the audience will receive him and it goes from like happy audience to sad audience mm-hmm. or angry audience very on the nose but speaking of how they're not casting Ben as enough of a loser him even knowing a place that has open mic of like no, yeah you don't leave the house you don't know Ben this wouldn't man. know in the future he'd be like I saw it on TV or yeah, exactly somebody uh, I don't know there'd be no way for him to actually have a nightlife he eats cereal and watches tv that's all that ben katz does he watches a lot of comedy central i bet yeah i bet bet he's a big misty uh so we get a scene with laura and the second patient uh, joy bahar uh joy is very impressed by her own sweater laura isn't she asked laura to read the tag it's 100 percent cotton or whatever or wool wool Mm -hmm. and laura says oh plus size is unlimited and that's the that's the scene i love that i think laura like she I think sometimes with guests, she actually did piss them off. Like, yeah, they or at least was natural for them to go like, I, I hate you. Like, I hate I think her best chemistry with a guest was with Fred Stoller. Like, yeah, they eventually just had like, oh, Fred will be in this episode. He won't even share a scene with Dr. Katz. It'll just be him <laughs> goofing around with Laura. Yeah, I just love when she her only response to be just like, <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love that. It's like, what if uh, could I just, I know I'm late, but hey, you know, a clock's always uh, right, a uh, broken clock's right twice a day. I could, I could get you a sign that says that for me, right? Yeah. Uh, I love Fred Stoller. He's so, he's so funny. He's great. He's still a treasure. Uh, mm-hmm. So Joy is on the show. I don't think her, her bits on the show aren't that great. I think they wanted mm-hmm. to put more light on Ray Romano in this episode because they clearly were in love with him. Yeah, well, I think Joy definitely feels, it feels more like they're 
they're trying to get something out of her, you know, like they she needs a lot more prompting from whoever yeah. was doing it. And it feels like she might be treating this like real therapy because the I guess the joke about her mom like I've never seen her stand up, but the joke about her mom is like her memories of her mom or of her mom washing things in the sink mm-hmm. and her mom was only happy when she would hear somebody died which is funny <laughs> I'm, again I'm summarizing stand up comedy mm. but uh, that's not funny but it's a funny joke but it's not at the level of Ray Romano yeah no I, I think I think probably she was a little out of practice with stand up at this time yeah. I, I mean she had even by 95 Joy had become more of like a host of things or like yeah. a panelist of things she was already in her 50s at this point yeah. so. and she'd be like put on the view in just a few years after this like once she started appearing on the original lineup of the view i was like oh hey it's joy from dr Katz. like and she is the constant on the show i, I think barbara walters isn't dead yet no. but she's not on the show <laughs> you say anymore. yet no no yeah. Uh, I mean, she's enjoy has been the host of the show through like so many awful blood. They always have to have like, well, we got to have a blonde Republican girl yeah. on here. Like, we need a blonde idiot who infuriates us. Yeah, that's. I mean, I guess it gets people to watch or whatever. Yeah, like that's the only time I've seen the views when they're saying something stupid. But yeah. uh, here's a bit about Joy and men. I don't really want to get married again. Mm-hmm. I'm at the point where I want a man in my life, but not in my house. Right. I'm on the phone all day long. I don't really see what they could do all day long with me. My feeling is come in, attach the VCR, and get out. Jeez, that's, that's a pretty strong statement. Why all the anger at men? Where's that coming from? Well, I be- no, it's not that I, I... I like men, but I could get angry with them. Yes, indeed. Last year, I spent $850 on pantyhose. Men are still wearing the same socks they wore to junior high school. They call them their lucky socks. How do you know that? I'm sick of them. <laughs> That's just the end of that line, the end yeah. of that scene. I'm sick of them. I did like the cut to Katz's socks in that yeah. scene to let you know it's true. So here's some facts about Joy Bahar or Josephine Victoria Ochutio oh. is her real name. Uh, married to Joe Bahar from 1965 to 1982. Jesus Christ. And uh, she did not wow, get... Wow, she looks way younger than she is. Yeah, she is 76. Wow. Uh, now, yes, she was much younger then, but uh, she got remarried in 2011, so she eventually found a man. Yeah, that part I did look up that like she's been with that guy. I don't know, like consistently, but like she, it, uh, Wikipedia said she was with that guy in '82 and only officially married him in 2011, which that's crazy that they have been together since I was born, uh, and I'm not young. But the, yeah, that they the, the part of her character is hating man like that was. Yeah, it falls into the very. I mean, it hasn't changed too much. But mm-hmm. '90s comedy was like men, women are different than men, and black people are different than white people. Just like mm-hmm. the dichotomy of the two sides. Yeah, that it's the observation of those things, which like that's that's always what it's been. That's always what stand up is. It just finds new ways to be the same thing, but also like. At this age, she's such a practice stand-up. I feel like she's taking things out of her old like book and just like ah, I haven't done this bit in a while. Like that, I think too that Doctor Katz and other Comedy Central type shows helped kill that. Like because you can't yeah. once you've been recorded doing it once, how do you keep doing it? You know, like actually, Doctor Katz unlocked in my brain the idea that stand-ups have material that they yeah. do over and over. Where it's like I would see Ray Romano on Dr. Katz and then I'd see him on like Letterman like wait a minute that's yeah. the same they don't they don't make up new jokes every night what's going mm-hmm. on but it's like well duh yeah it demystified it a lot for a lot of rubes like us then we we all thought like this funny person just thought to say these things like it that goes away but once that goes away then you start knowing like oh, this person isn't giving me anything new. I've heard this before. Like, uh, I think, too, you talk about how, like, uh, I know we talk about baseball all the time. Oh, yeah. But (laughs) when you talk about record holders, like, 50 years ago, it's like, well, yeah, Babe Ruth probably couldn't do so well against modern-day players. It was a all their drugs. (laughs) And it's uh, it's different than, too. Like, a current-day stand-up has to produce so much more stuff. They can't just be Jackie Gleason doing the same bit all over the world where nobody can share it, you know? I feel like the, when people talk about Lenny Bruce or whatever, it's like, well, how would he function now? Yeah. You know? Like, how would, how would George Carlin 
and function now, those kind of things. Yeah, I was just thinking, I saw Brian Posehn. That's the last stand-up I saw was Brian Posehn mm. in uh, last year. And I will say 80% of his material was new. Oh, that's nice. So I was happy to see that. I saw Gaffigan uh, in Vegas like four years ago, and he, he did... All new material that I never heard before, and it's not like I've watched all of his things, but it was all new to me. And then at the end, I think because he was in Vegas, he's like, "These people paid for hot pockets. I I, I got to give them hot pockets." And, and hot pockets pays for his life. The audience was the opposite of like if this was in an alternative club and they heard him pull out hot pockets, they'd be like, "Ugh, get out of here, old man." But here, the second he said, and "You know what I like? Hot pockets." Woo! Ooh, he's gonna yeah! do it. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what about Hot Pockets. This may, this may be a normie opinion, <laughs> but uh, the first time I heard it, I was listening to his CD that the bit was on, and I almost had to pull over. I was crying in my car. It, it was so funny. It's one of the best stand-up bits ever. Yeah, it really it's is. so it's, good. It's boring. Uh, it's a boring normie opinion, but it yeah. really is great. Uh, and it's this whole set about like kudos, like uh, health, like granola bars, oh, like yeah, let's make it a candy yeah. bar kind of thing. Uh, I'm not doing it justice, but it's so funny. So I have a scene with Laura up next. She wants in uh, just for the sheer joy of seeing humiliation on stage. Folk music? Yeah, yeah. Like an open mic, like, like anybody can go kind right of. right like he gets up and he he, he gets to, uh, to play a song folk songs yeah old folk songs folks that he wrote um some originals couple covers really yeah yeah and uh i thought you'd like to uh, maybe come along uh you know with me and listen to him to be honest that sounds so horribly painful and humiliating i mean for you and for him yeah sort of i'll go really yeah right <laughs> That's Laura. Love that. I love uh, so she's only motivated for uh, cruelty. Like she doesn't care about anything else, but like the uh, the the sheer cruelty of it. She wants I, to do it. When I got that first season DVD and listened to the commentaries and found out that Ben and Laura were dating. Oh yeah, we didn't mention that, did we? During the production of this, my jaw dropped and broke up. Yeah, and broke up. And, and in fact, they were better performers after they broke up. It, it's, uh, apparently, it's funny to hear both of them reflect on that on the commentary too, because uh, like Benjamin, I think is a bit of a, a private person, and I think for Laura Silverman, that relationship is so in her past. Yeah, like, they were living together. That's so crazy that they that they then played characters who hate each other. Well, one hates the other. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, that I think too, though. That dating chemistry comes through in this episode maybe more than any other where like there's a little moment where you're like, wait, is the show actually putting them together? Like uh, that that comes a little later. But this kind of exchange here, this wouldn't have been out of place in a regular will they won't yeah. be sitcom. I mean, there were two potential love interests for the characters in that uh, Laura could have been Ben's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that they established Julie at the bar as a potential love interest for cats, but they never went anywhere with that. Yeah, the, and it was funny. To, it was always funny to see cats like flustered by her and Ben flustered by Laura and trying to keep like she, she would say no to everything mm. that he would offer. Yeah, the I remember the episode where it was cats teaches Julie music and they're like playing guitar together and there's definitely they're playing up their chemistry a bit there too. Which uh, you know what I meant to mention it earlier in the production of the show. This isn't saved in the DVDs because it was just one-offs, but they did product placements in Dr. Katz. Really? Yeah, I swear to God, in some reruns of it, they would just draw in like a Pepsi cup or Dorito bags into a scene that had it been in like a rerun, but these were never, I, I feel like I'm crazy remembering it because I could never find it, but I swear to God, they, they put it in there. I think it was them trying to find other ways for the show to make money. Interesting. Huh. And, in, and in just a very innocent way, Tom Snyder was like, we could just draw like a, coke can in here or something wow. like i i definitely think they were working with yum brands that's for sure i uh, uh it was just so strange though and it's it's lost to time because those were just in like one-off reruns hmm. Weird. I don't remember that at all. So we get more of Ray Romano. I looked it up, actually. He was born in 57, so he was 37 when recording this stuff. So our age. Oh, wow. And wow. apparently he's having problems in the bedroom <laughs> uh, where he's talking about spicing up his sex life, being married, 
and uh, he wants to know why anyone would need a room for four hours. He wants a 20 minute room. And I guess when he's having fun with his wife, he goes to like hourly rate hotels. Mm-hmm. Maybe these are, you know, fun themed room things too. Yeah. Maybe that's part of the brand. I, you know, I agree with him though. Things should only. I think everything in life should only last 20 minutes. That includes sex. Yes. Uh, Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. It's true. It's a lot of work. But uh, (laughs) here is a joke about premature ejaculation. Four hours. Who are these guys who need a room for four hours? They think they do. That's the way it is. It's always that way with sex. You're in the four-hour mode when you start. You know, like, oh, this is going to be a marathon. Oh, I'm going to wear a number on my back, and people are going to have to bring me cups of water. And it never ends up because it's always pacing. That's what it is. That's my problem. My pacing is off because I start in the four-hour pace, but something, you know what it is? You always go that one move too far, and then you then you try to save it. No, don't move, honey. Freeze. <laughs> don't. You, oh, you moved. You moved. It's not my fault. Come on. You clearly exhaled. Don't look at me. (laughs) Where's the remote? That's so funny. (laughs) I love you moved. I love that. I love the that it can feel that way sometimes. Yeah, I I will say not to TMI, but kind of relatable. Yeah, it is. It is relatable. Look, it's just listen. If it's what are you doing? If it's more than an hour, what are you doing? Figure it out. Exactly. Yeah. Like I. Maybe uh, maybe we're just really outing ourselves as bad lovers, but um, <laughs> uh, but I just love his reaction. Like you moved, it's not my like. He's instantly going to like it's not my fault. It's Don't not look my at fault. me. Uh, I I also really uh, love the artist design of Ray in his towel looking in yeah. there. Like oh, I'm gonna go all Flexing. night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Again, uh, he laments on the commentary. He can't do these jokes anymore. He misses the dirtier <laughs> jokes. And these are still like PG-13, mm-hmm. like fun, uh, cable-friendly, uh, coming too fast jokes. Yes, yeah. Speaking of that, I was uh, alarmed and shocked when I was looking at Comedy Central promos to just put myself back in the Pendulette era of Comedy Central. And I found a promo that was on a ton of my MST3K tapes that were sent to me by dubbers. Like okay. I was getting access to things I'd never seen before. And this promo was also on YouTube. So it was a promo for the fall 93 season, except they're launching it in July because they're a fun cable network. What oh, will happen next? I remember that. And yeah, the entire yeah. joke is the entire joke is they, they came too fast. Like Whoa. excitement is starting to grow. Uh, we're, we're coming early. We're, instead of in fall, we're coming in July and everyone's like in bed <laughs> And it's all like cum jokes, and the fucking robots are there for Mystery Science Theater, wow. like singing the song. Wow. And at the end of the promo, like when I was a naive kid, I was like, "Oh yeah, the premature baby, probably that's the joke." No, no, it's all about premature ejaculation. I think that's what I thought too. Yeah, me too. And it's like I watched it again. I was like, "No, this can't." And then at the end, like the uh, so the old Comedy Central logo was like towers coming out of the earth, right? Yes. At the end of that promo, you see the logo and the towers like deflate. <sighs> Wow. So, filth. Wow. Filth on the air in 1993. Uh, I need to call my pastor yeah. about that. That's wow. I That all went over my head. At a, like one of the I lyrics mean, is like, think about baseball. Wow. Yeah. I, that is crazy. I mean, again, I was in 93, I was pre sexual, so I didn't understand these concepts. Yeah. But yeah. Kids grow up a lot faster now. I think they would get that. But uh, wow. I, damn. So, this I network was going that. there. Uh, that, I mean, the joke about like you moved, it, it also just reminded me of how often on the show comedians would do these sex jokes and that were also specifically about like positions or where to be. And I feel for the animators trying to find a way to draw this without getting in trouble. Yeah. Like, yeah. They'd often just do a bunch of shapes under blankets. Yes. Yeah. Or like an extreme close up on just like someone's eye or whatever. Yeah. And you just have to imagine the things around it. Like, uh, I think it was uh, the comedian Mitch Fatel. He was talking about like how he he couldn't give a woman an orgasm if his life depended on it. He's yeah. like, "It's just too many things in there." I remember and, the line: "More parts than a ten-speed bike." Yes, yeah. And he said like, and when they're even giving you directions, they go like, "Okay, it's like a bomb. It's like somebody trying to land a plane." They're like, "Okay, uh, did do you see that? Yeah, I see it. Okay, then touch that." <laughs> and may God have mercy on us all. <laughs> yeah, what do you animate for that? Exactly, yeah. You I can't think, animate him going down on a woman. I think it was a lot of uh, eyes in the dark. I think they <laughs> And also like too. a man flying a plane. Yeah. What were they doing with Ray? I totally forgot. What, are they, what, yeah. what were they doing with Ray 
when the during the you moved part. I think it's just his face. Yeah, I think it's yeah. just his face. Same with uh there was another one where uh, I forget the 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 woman joker about it, the the woman comedian about it. Uh but it was about dating an optometrist. He says bear like this, bear like this. Oh, bear like this, yeah. bear like this. But that was all just in the dark. They couldn't do any other thing with that. So we're finally at the open mic night and Ben is pretending he's on a date with Laura, mm-hmm. wondering what it would be to be more like a date. <laughs> and she says if you were a different guy, Love that. it would be I, more like a date. I like their date night outfits too. They're nice. I probably that Formal def- Ben. That defined for me like, "Oh, this is how you dress up." Is how Ben dresses. You you put on a black shirt and wear pants instead of yes. shorts. And uh, I don't know what his shoes are doing, but probably still tennis shoes. I love his uh, his shorts look too. That's also though I uh, try to never wear shorts. I, I think I'm in a new fear. shorts phase. I know it's also, been crazy to see your your uh, uh, calves this yeah much. my tattoos and uh, it's really hot today, so I'm yes. glad I wear shorts. But yeah, shorts are the sign of a man, baby. I know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Katz is vamping on the stage again. The point of the was this like a bit he did on stage yes, where yeah, yeah. it was like oh, that reminds me of a story he like starts playing songs like and then he goes into a different story instead of actually doing the song i believe i see i'd seen him do this a couple times in in a live action appearances on comedy central i think he also sort of did this on the show make me laugh mm. i believe he did at least one appearance on there same with frank conniff oh uh, yeah i laugh. know i watched that show just because of frank conniff yep he he sang a song about um the little house on the prairie guy What's his name? Michael Landon. Yeah, Michael Landon. He did a movie about a kid who wets the bed. Everybody who grew up in the 70s knows that movie. Yeah, yeah. The that, Loneliest Runner. I only know it because of the Mr. Show sketch Show, about yeah. it. Yeah. So Katz is going into a little bit of his autobiography. He talks about uh, he wrote this song when he was a student living in a farmhouse in 1970 when he was 23. And now he has a son that age. And he's here tonight. <laughs> and uh, Ben is very embarrassed. And then we get the very, very touching song about Ben, oh which I love. I love it, too. Hey, Ben. Yeah. Remember that song I used to sing for you when you were little? Uh, no. No, I don't. <laughs> Let me refresh your memory. I actually wrote this song for you. A boy, a bike, a heart so full, a mom, and a dad, and a little stuffed bull. Oh, God. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> ben? Dad. Will you forgive me, please? Yes. Yeah, right away. You're forgiven. Is you, there uh, some way I can make it up to you? Yep. Show's up there, folks. Show's on the stage. So sweet. <laughs> I think when I was watching Dr. Katz, it was in 96 when I started watching. And uh, I was not watching them in order. It was like whatever was on every weeknight at 11. And mm-hmm. this hit the rotation. I'm like, wow, this show can get emotional. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really sweet moment, especially when you know that, like, he's a child of divorce and that uh, the bro, like, you can now see that Bully represents the promise of a stable family that he did not have. Yeah. And now I'm starting to see like the codependency, the very sweet and lovely codependency where it's like Ben uh, is afraid he'll be abandoned. And so he basically uh, is upset about that. He gets over it. And then he's like, he's annoyed by his dad. He's like, dad, uh, this thing you're doing, go away from me when you do it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly Ben wants to go. Yeah. And Dr. Katz, he sings a song about his son when he's on stage to his son. He like serenades his son. So (laughs) they cannot escape each other. Yeah. They they just want to keep replaying the same loops of, uh, of childhood over and over again and it gets sadder as they both get older but they can't they can't escape it uh, I mean and that's what makes them sitcom characters in real life you it's a giant tragedy if they yeah. never escape that and in this case it's sweet yeah in this case it's yeah sweet. I mean uh, Ben is kind of a tragic character and Katz is lightly tragic in his own way but I think in this era of comedy in this era of Comedy Central they don't go dark mm-hmm. they don't get dark with the characters where yeah. anyone like 10 years later that would be the joke like, what? Ben is jerking off all the time. Ben is a creep. Yeah, they would have... I mean, even in an episode, I believe one of the plot lines was that Ben was stalking a woman. Yeah. It was still, like, sweetly stalking. It was very weird. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh, well, this is also a weird uh, change of situation. Normally, it's Ben that embarrasses Katz, and, but this is a rare time where Katz embarrasses him. Uh, and that they're in the same room with uh, with Julie and Will LeBeau, which is just so crazy that they don't talk to each other. But 
They they also uh, I like when they play up in later episodes that his mom is not like innocent. She's actually someone who abandoned her child and wanted nothing to do. Yeah, which is later played uh, by Carrie Fisher in the that's series. Right, yeah, which but that is such a huge shift from how it's normally played. Like, but that is definitely that the Jonathan Katz plays the feminine role in that dichotomy. While meanwhile, the Carrie Fisher, who is a very like forceful personality, so good at casting there, but they, they just completely abandon <laughs> his son. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of episodes actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there's a ton of episodes about them both being upset by a change in their relationship mm-hmm. that they have with each other. Like there's one episode called it takes them getting used to, and it's all about how Ben is super offended that Dr. Katz is seeing a woman yeah like he's very upset by it so like any change of the status quo upsets both of them <laughs> or there was like one evening where uh be- uh cats got drunk and oh drinky the drunk like, guy drinky, drinky the drunk guy that's not yeah. really forever yeah me too i think about that all the time <laughs> and that's uh, when friend, <laughs> that's uh, when uh, his name is you <laughs> yeah cats actually gets pissed at ben i like whenever he actually gets mad <laughs> uh, but God, gently yeah. mad yeah gently mad or uh the episode two where like Ben says he's going to move out because cats won't let the mom stay in their apartment. And then he's like, uh, I'm, I'm looking to move out somewhere. And he, he's calling a place to look for at apartments. He's like, no, no, no. Uh, money is not a problem. The opposite. Really? No, the opposite of that. <laughs> no, the opposite of that. Yep. There you go. Yep. That's yeah. awesome. Oh, also his song "Loving You" is no guarantee that they will love you back. Yeah, like, <laughs> that very yeah. on the nose. I love that. Yeah. So uh, Ben and Laura meet up in the alley after he pees a little. It was like the good kind of pain, you know. Do you know what I mean by the good kind of pain? Like no, like no. when you have a canker sore, like right on the inside of your cheek, and mm. you just keep chewing on it because it's 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 like the good kind of pain. Yeah, you yeah, can't I stop. Can. It's sort of yeah. like a like a turn on. Really. Yeah, oh, I could I, I could chew on sores all night. I love them. <laughs> I love sores. I I chew on a big sore. Yeah, they just fade out of whatever That's that improv where that scene was. Has to end. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice touch of Ben where like Laura hates him uh, and is repulsed by him. But whenever they have a conversation, uh, I like this. He's immediately like willing to turn on a dime to fit whatever need she wants. He's like, you know this thing? No. Well, I like this thing. Oh, I like it too. In fact, I like it the most. <laughs> it's great. Oh, I could yeah. do that all day. Yeah, I love that. I love that he's uh, that like this type of character. He gets so much play now of just like this totally desperate doormat of a loser. It's just like, oh, yeah. uh, you you hate it? I hate it too. Yeah, I totally hate if that. If I do anything you say, you're bound to respect me, as Milhouse <laughs> thought. Yeah, you know, the 90s is really when these, uh, not that there weren't lovable losers or even not lovable losers in comedy before that, but the 90s really did, you know, spotlight this specific kind of arrested development man child i think it know? informed a lot of my early adulthood too yeah it told me it could be a choice like, and oh, I, I could be a lovable loser it's like no you're just an asshole yeah it turns out in real life if you pretend to be ben or you you take character lessons from him you're actually unlikable and people don't want to be around you. but the good thing about ben is they never really uh give him a reward or yeah. give him a woman uh laura never changes her mind like i feel like a loser like ross on friends gets whatever he wants yeah. and that's the point he should uh, he should got a kick in the dick that's yeah all he send got. ross to prison yeah, same uh, all, all the editorial columns about friends are right <laughs> it's a terrible show with yeah. bad people uh where everybody's like yeah but what if i was gay you right it's like that's yuck. every episode so it's every single one. I feel like Lisa Kudrow is the one actor on there is like, I think I don't want to say it's gross to be gay. Could we not do that? She's the uh, best one on there. She got out clean. But this moment here, it's like the closest they ever got to being a couple or actually pulling a trigger on them of like, this is just kind of a cute moment between them. It is about the gross thing of saying like chewing on a sore in your yeah. mouth. But but I mean, Laura is only opening up to Ben because she is feel- she's feeling the high of experiencing uh, mm-hmm. Katz's embarrassment. She's like, that was great. <laughs> I think she is a slightly turned on by it. Yeah. You think, which is weird. She is a sadist. Yeah, yeah. Which like maybe Ben doesn't need, may- 
I think Benton, part of his arrested development is that he is so attached to this like bad woman for him. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I also do love uh, Ben Benjamin saying like, "I came out here to pee for a while." Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like he was thinking of an excuse, but it turned into a really gross excuse. Yes, yeah, yeah. He just he, wanted to get out, and we, he needed to say like, "I just needed some space to think," but instead he's like to pee for a while, so he's gonna pee in the alley, like which is a gross thing to say. <laughs> It's true. And uh, I love this episode. I really wish we would have gotten a scene between Katz and Ben at the end. Like, I feel like there's one piece missing and that we never hear what they think about their situation in life and what that what this song means to them or whatever. I think after this episode, they learned more so episodes can end with Ben and Katz talking more about their stuff over the credits. Yeah, that's true. uh, Yeah, one of my favorites was at the end of their um, movie-going episode where they're just like, oh, here's here's a good movie. Jews, Steven Spielberg, 1975, (laughs) a beach is terrorized. Like, no, 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 Dad, it's it's Jaws. And so I was like, oh, okay, I got my glasses. (laughs) I I just love that line. Until Penn Jillette interrupted them. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why they didn't do it as much. Politically incorrect. (laughs) Uh, so we get our last bit with Joy Bahar, who gets I incredibly... I have ended with her. No, no. It's oh, wait, a... yeah, she's not last. It's right. No, Ray I mean, it's last. weird to go from the sweet story to, to swerve into Joy Bahar being very angry at Dr. Katz. Very. <laughs> like, she's immediately hostile, especially about her weight issues, and starts I agree with yelling her, at Dr. Katz about being bald and having nose hairs. <laughs> like, I find you repulsive. Uh, I love how he says, should I wear them up? Like, that is... Uh... A very dad joke response. Yes, yeah. I love when that comes... That the cat Cat skill comedian of be- of cats comes out. That's something that's really useful to them uh, as this is an improv endeavor. Is that he is such a road tested comedian that he has like eight million jokes in the back of his head he can just pull out at any time, like just like that. Like it's it's really impressive, but he plays it so low key that you you don't think about it. Yeah, it just yeah. feels supernatural. Yeah. But uh, here, here, Doctor Katz almost has a Me Too moment. I find you looking at me sometimes in a very leering manner. That's a that's a defect. That's a palsy in my, in my, uh, I was in an accident and I leer now. I don't, I don't believe you. I think that you're a pervert, that you really are leering and ogling, you know, especially at my humongous breasts. <laughs> I did, to tell you the truth, didn't even notice the, the, the size of them and the shape of them. Now I feel even worse. No, I'm saying I never really took in the fullness of your breasts. That's all the weight of them. <laughs> really? But Joy, in my role as a therapist, how I feel about you as a man is not really germane. Is there something disgusting and despicable and, and hideous about me that you haven't shared? I've shared it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That's the right point. It's super to like that Marx scene. Brothers y. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, boy, I didn't like the cut to the oranges. That's yeah. uh, such a bit on the nose. But it's like, there. what do you do with a woman talking about her breasts yeah, when I you're an animator so. on the show? Like, yeah. you have to find some visual gag. <laughs> uh, I do, I do like that. She seems offended, but she also like kind of proudly uh, describes her breasts as humongous. Yeah, I think she wants the attention, Henry. Mm, oh, that's Bob, a risky thing to say. Yeah, I yeah. think that is the joke. Though. I believe like, that's please, please notice my breasts. I believe that's the character yeah. she is playing. Yeah. there, yes. Yeah. I believe me. I don't actually think that, but I think mm. that's what the joke is in the scene. Yeah. Um, we end with Ray Romano, and I'm not an imprisoned house husband like him, but I do work from home just like you, Henry. Uh, yes. And I do make it a point to be like, oh, I go to Target. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't call me crazy. I still don't really feel it. I I go, I think I have more anxiety issues than you. Yeah. If we could rank our anxieties, like after three hours, competition. <laughs> after three hours in my apartment, like, I gotta get out. Oh, I gotta leave. <laughs> Uh, man, I just, uh, I have my friend, the TV in the computer box mm. whenever I feel that there are like two to three days. I just don't leave the apartment. Ooh. Like I just stay in here. I'm like, just thinking of that. And my brain is screaming. Uh, I'm uh, though. I also, one thing Ray isn't saying is that that's why he is a stand up that he gets to leave all the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's his, when he doesn't have gigs, that's when he can, not when he can leave that though him talking about booking gigs in this bit here too, is like, it reminded me uh, a thing on the show that they could kind of didn't really figure out they'd go either way on it of like 
are these people regular people talking yeah. to Dr. Katz, or are they famous stand-ups who then talk about being a stand-up to Dr. Katz? And they just kind of played it by ear with like however the guest wanted to do it. I mean, when he had a Rodney Dangerfield, he's Rodney Dangerfield. And yeah. I think uh, stand-up comedy changed where stand-up comedy up until a certain point in history was like, I'm on stage, a person talking to you, telling you stories. I'm not, you won't hear about my life as a comic. That's too like inside baseball. That's too uh, personal. But now it's just like you talk about being a comic yes, and writing yeah. comedy and traveling because you're a comic. I think up until this point, that super wasn't done a lot. No, no. And I mean, now it's taken to such an extreme of just like, that's most of what the stand up talks about. Yeah. It's like, I went to a very funny night of comedy by Hannibal Burris. I didn't know what his stand up was going to be on his new stuff before I went there. But I felt pretty safe in assuming he'd talk about Twitter for at least uh, 10 minutes, and he did, uh, but also read it. Like, and it's just, that's even a great stand-up you like. A lot of them will be like, now it's time to pause and reply to the people who said something on Reddit that I couldn't reply to then, and now I'm going to do it live. Yeah. And it's just, it gets old. It gets old. I don't, I don't want to hear about the internet history of every stand-up I like. Of just like, I mean, Ricky Gervais is one of the worst at ooh, it. Ooh, ooh. Like, that he is. Talk about trigger. He is so, but he he has to spend 30 minutes of his goddamn special telling you how much he was not offended by somebody who was offended. I think, though, it's weird to think about the context of when you listen to stand-up, is that when you watch Ray Romano or Jim Gaffigan or, like, a regular stand-up, you think, like, this is a guy, a normal guy, I believe everything about his life. Like, in this context, you think Ray Romano is a house husband. He's not a guy who travels around that's a comedian, does a bunch of cool, crazy stuff. Mm. I think, like, that is context added later with later comedians who are like, yes, I'm a comic, you're looking at a comic, I live the life of a comic, and here's my life. (laughs) When I would see Steinfeld material that I thought was really good, but it was him post his show and being one of the most famous people in the world one thing he was struggling with was just like how do i still have yeah personal anecdotes that are not about like you know how you have a butler or do you know yeah. how in- or like if jerry seinfeld is telling you a joke like don't you hate when this happens it's like well you've got a billion dollars replace the thing fix yeah, the thing hire anything. someone to fix yeah. it for you yeah <laughs> sorry yeah it's uh and then you've got folks who like uh, this happened with Tina Fey as well. I think I still think she's a funny writer and like, but in her case, like on Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, her daughter went to college, and then of course she had to have like three goddamn episodes about how kids in college don't know anything and they're too sensitive. And I'm just like, get the fuck over it. Like yeah. I, I'm sorry, your kid yelled at you when they're 19. Like you don't understand a younger generation. That's never happened. Yeah. Uh, I, I prefer accepting they're old. Dr. Katz accepts he's old. Like he, and he's not in tune with kids today. Anyway. Yeah. This race stuff. Uh, it, these jokes are very funny. So. They are. Uh, I have a bird interrupting me on my calls. Oh, that's, uh, that's, I've had, I've had to hear that bird, <laughs> but it's sweet. It's, he's a, he's a sweet boy. Like he's, he's a little loser like Ben. <laughs> He also thinks like, oh, we're all having conversations, right? Yeah. Let me let me get in on this. So here's the final clip. We hear some of the famous going out music, too. So you're saying it's hard to get any work done at home? My three-year-old runs the house. The hardest thing, you know, I can't even make a phone call. Every, every business call I try in my house, I screw up. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, the 15th is fine with me. I just need to know where do you think you're going with that cookie? <laughs> Put the cookie down. Not you. Sorry. <laughs> didn't mean to scare you. Oh, I didn't know you were eating a cookie. Of course I'm interested. Every time I'm there, I smell cocky. <laughs> it's the cocky, Doc. Yeah. That's what it is. Sure. I have the twin towers of poop in my house right now. <laughs> Whoops, you know what the music means. Our time is up. I love the device of the music because it is otherworldly sometimes to the mm-hmm. characters where it's just TV show music playing them out. But I like when it interrupts them. Like, wait, what's happening? Yeah. It's like, oh, the music means we end now. Uh, and in this scene, there's a joke about it where, like, uh, they just start kind of looking around until the credits start. Like, it's nothing all is in happening. Animation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think they said a few seconds to burn. Like, I what think, could the joke be here? I think so. Yeah. There's. It was fun to see what comedian would do. It. It was also part of the fun was when usually most episodes had two comedians, and you wanted to guess who was the one who got the wrap up music. You know, and it was it was fun to wait for who'd get it. I remember a couple who were just like. Uh, well, I reject the music. I don't care. Yeah. Like, you can't stop me. Or 
or uh, David Tell would just scream at him and be like, when do I get better? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bloodsucker? Huh? I love that. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, the, his jokes about I smell cocky, I was like, boy, I I'm, smell glad, cocky. I'm glad I don't have children. This yeah. is pretty I nice. can have enough poop as it is with a little bird. <laughs> but yeah, that was Dr. Katz. It's so much fun to revisit this show. Again, uh, you can just leave it on in the background. It's great like mm-hmm. background audio just to hear like soft, fun conversations and great stand-up. And uh, like I said, it's all on DVD with great commentaries, but also it's not being policed and it's all on YouTube and it's in pretty good quality. But yeah. this quality can only be so good on a show in Squiggle Vision. Yeah, yeah. So even even if you bought the DVDs for the direct rips, they don't look that amazing. Yeah, like, yeah. It's the best possible version of that low-quality signal. You know what? If they had actually held on to the files, they could maybe even just like re-export it in them. HD. Like, who what, knows? what program was that even in? Who knows? I don't know. I, Some old Corel program. I did have one last note on it, though, that the... Uh, I actually looked in this time at the end of mo- many of their episodes, they credit a hotel where people stay. Yeah, that's right. Wherever they would record illegally. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the credited hotel, it is still open today. Uh, you can stay in it if you're in the Harvard area. It's in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. According to Hotels.com, it's a four-star hotel. And uh, you'd have to pay at least 400 a night right now if you wanted to book a room. So I bet the show got those rooms comped just by the advertisement. I got it think that at least helped it yeah, yeah put in that there the uh so that finally that is answered for me i'm glad it's still open that one yes uh, i'm sure many a rich parent has stayed there while their kid is attending hov yes and they would frown on all of us for visiting <laughs> the show is still so fun to revisit it is like pure comfort food i just feel playing a video game and having that on in the background yeah just relaxes me and takes me back. Like I definitely before podcasts, before commentaries, before I even had like stand up albums. If I could play like Dragon Quest on my Game Boy while my tape of Doctor Cats played in the background, like that was just soothing and comforting yeah. to me. And I get back in that headspace. Before podcasts, I would often play like Mystery Science Theater or Doctor yeah, Cats on tapes yeah. and just play a Game Boy or a whatever or, DS or for a. Benjamin Cat style nap. I'd do yeah. the same too. It'd be perfect uh, sleep inducing. Fill up stuff. on cereal first, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know uh, why we decided to land on Doctor Cats, but I think that uh, we all just kind of miss it. And mm-hmm. we've done so many of the Doctor Cat style shows. I think we needed to start with like the 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 um, primordial goop. Yeah, that, that yeah. would eventually lead to home movies and everything that's gotten much more attention. Like ten years of Bob's Burgers now. So if we ever want to do Science Court, we got to do this one first. Yeah, to yeah. Set it up. Yeah, I, uh, the the. Show Show still echoes in my mind. I when I took a shower today and was turning the heat up, I was remembering the Ray Romano oh, bit yeah. about how you can't get the it right and how the scariest thing is is where you turn it up and then it gets cold for a second, like it has to back <laughs> up to then really hit you with the heat. I think of that every time I turn the shower on. I swear <laughs> to God, uh, my brain was very elastic back then, not so much now. Yes, it's a ton of fun to return to, and the new Audible thing is is really nice too. If you've got if you got an Audible membership it's it's worth checking out hmm, i'll check it out then so thanks for listening to what a cartoon if you want to help out the show and get every episode one week ahead of time and ad free please go to patreon.com slash talking simpsons to support our entire network it is our full-time jobs and if you sign up at the five dollar level you'll get access to all kinds of amazing podcasts that you haven't heard yet if you're not on the patreon that includes all of our limited mini series and so much more i dare say over 100 bonus episodes are waiting there for you if you sign up today at the five dollar level at patreon.com slash talking simpsons and henry what is happening at the ten dollar level extra long podcast every month about special subjects my goodness yes for our ten dollar and up patrons they get to hear the sister podcast to this what a cartoon movie where we give the same what a cartoon treatment to a different animated feature film once a month we've done so many great ones in the past this month in september if you sign up at the ten dollar level you'll get to hear us do the Cowboy Bebop movie from 2001. It is going to be a great time talking about that gorgeously animated film and how it came to be. And if you sign up now, you get to hear all the previous ones too, plus each next month's one. On top of all those other $5 benefits. So please sign up today at the $10 level, even patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. So I've been one of your hosts, Bob Mackey. Find me on Twitter as Bob Servo. My other podcast is Retronauts, a classic gaming podcast. 
every Monday and occasionally on Friday, go to RetroNauts.com and look for RetroNauts wherever you find podcasts. If you have ever played a video game, I'm sure you'll find something to like about it. Henry, how about you? You can follow me, Henry Gilbert, on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. I tweet out a lot of fun thoughts there, and including whenever new stuff goes up, both on the Patreon and on the free feeds. I am certain to promote it, so you'll learn about it there. Stay in the loop by following me on Twitter, H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you next week for the Cyber 6 episode, Mysterious Shadow, and we'll see you then. Want to hear a little blues? No. That's bluesy, all right. Wow, this is exactly what I uh, I didn't want to hear right now. Yeah. You sure uh, know what you're doing on that? You're picking. You're picking fine blues. You know, your mother and I used to, we used to listen to the blues all the time when we were in school. That's a great story, Dad. What the... Uh, do little dum bum 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 Um... Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. If you're in business, you probably have a website, but can your site handle your growth? How many visitors before your site slows down or crashes? What about storage and data security? From web hosting to virtual servers, Pair Networks provides the online infrastructure you need to start, grow, and flourish. When it comes to security and updates, don't worry, we've got you covered. Our 24-7 U.S.-based customer support is the best in the industry. No frustrating chatbots are sitting on hold for hours. Check out Pair.com today to learn more. That's P-A-I-R dot com.